Hello, this is going to be the Oxford Map live stream, but don't worry, we haven't started yet. Um, if you're watching the replay, you can skip about 15 minutes into the video for the actual start at what was five o'clock. That's the past tense, even though for me at the moment, five o'clock is the future. Um, I've gone live because some anonymous person in chat asked me to, and they asked nicely. Uh, so I guess, if nothing else, you get to see what I spend 15 minutes just before the live stream starts doing. Uh, and that is frantically looking at questions, because if I'm honest, I haven't had time to look at them before now. Uh, probably important to be uh, honest there. Um, today, you know, the live streams have often got a kind of pretty thrown together, rough and tumble kind of uh, approach, uh, even more so today, um, where I haven't done the same amount of preparation I normally do. That means we're going to get authentic question solving. Um, I've zoomed over here because I think I've read this question, but I've never tried it. So it'll be really interesting to see if we get to do, do this one today. I'm just scrolling down because I can. Oh, I think I talked about this one on a live stream with maybe you decided a couple of years ago. Is there a request in chat to see the shrinkflation cubes? Um, hi, Herb, you right there? Um, let's put the... Huh, I'm going to plug in the camera. <laughs> Also, you get to see live stream setup if you tune in early. Uh, so, I, because this is also my desk where I do work, it's not always set up as a live streaming. What's the word? Live streaming booth? Live streaming scene? Studio. That's the word. It's, uh, it functions as a studio now, but it's, it's also just like a regular office. So, have to do a lot of plugging stuff in. Let's see. Is that going to do a. Is that going to do reality? No, it's not going to do reality. Okay. I have a request to see the shrinkflation cubes. So we're going to have another look at those if I can get this to connect to that. One, two, three, four. That's reality. Right there. I'm going to try and move the massive cables away from away from that. Hi, if you've just joined us, we're um we're not live yet, don't worry. Um we're just looking at stuff. Um, there was a request in chat to look at some cubes. Uh, because I like them, I've got them all on my desk. Um, so we're going to try and look at some cubes. It's reality! Hooray! Um, so this is a video that we made for Twitter, or, or I suppose X as it's now called, and social media. It's gone on the Oxford Maths Twitter, and I think it's also going on the Central University Twitter, which I'm very excited about. They're, they're letting me on the, on the kind of main university, uh, uh, university uh, channel. Um, so I'm excited about that. Um, so I had to make lots of these cubes in order to demonstrate if you make something twice as large in each direction it gets really quite a lot bigger. Those ones don't really fit on screen, do they? Um, but then the main point of the video is that you can slightly shrink something. If you have a shrink ray that shrinks the dimensions of a cube by just 20% in each direction, then because it shrunk by 20% kind of three times, 20% in each direction, um, the small cube here has half the volume of the big cube, which I think it's really surprising. It looks about the same size, <laughs> but the squares look about the same size. And in fact, the squares are almost the same size, but the depth matters as well. Um, so you know, a little sibling cube here is half the volume. If they're made of uh, something heavy and solid, then uh, it's going to be half the weight. Um, and the video then goes on to talk about chocolate and talk about shrinkflation, which is uh, how you get views, I guess. Um, but I think there's a maths fact here about what it looks like to shrink something by a factor of two. And you're, you're watching the Matt live stream. You're about to be in 10 minutes time. Um, so you're watching the show, you you know about powers and how to do the calculation, right? So there's, there's some power law you could do for uh, the volume is half as much. So the side length has been multiplied by, let's say X. Um, the volume has then been changed by X cubed because the volume has been, well, the side length cubed to make the volume of a cube. Uh, so this is one and this is x, uh, so for the ratio perhaps, and um, then x cubed. Uh, if x cubed is one half, then x is two to the minus one third. Um, but the really interesting thing is the value of that number, because the value of that number is not really what I expected. Oh, someone in chat's asked for two to the one third, um, which is this kind of scaling rule. Um, so two to the positive one third is what you would scale from scale by to get the side lengths from the small cube to this larger one. Um, because if it's, again, I think it's easier to say x. Um, if you scale each length by x, then it gets x times larger in this direction, and the width, and the depth. 
all of those have got x times larger. So overall, that's x cubed times larger. So if, if the number x is 2 to the 1 third, then the big cube becomes twice the volume overall over on that side. Uh, uh, Erb would like to see the cuboids that we cut off, or they're kind of like a, I'm not really sure what they are. You know, Flatten the bits that we the bits that have been removed. Um, actually, no, a maths activity that's a bit like that, um, where you build a cube out of smaller cubes, kind of layer by layer. Um, there's a really nice fact about a uh, difference of two cubes hiding in there. You know the difference of two squares, right? The difference of two squares is how you would build up a square to a larger square by kind of building a square. Let's see if I can get it on camera. There we go. Boom. Uh, have your first square and then have a kind of bit round the outside to make the square larger. Maybe that's not a great angle. Making live graphics out of a 3D object. Yeah, I can't really make that look like a square on top of a square. Um, I don't know. Volumes. Uh, does this principle... See, then the really fun thing is that this principle, this 2 to the 1 third factor, applies to anything that you're multiplying three times. Um, and I think it's a little bit surprising that that's not just all about cubes. The Twitter video, which is really short, we could have just watched it in this time. Um, the Twitter video starts with cubes, which feels very mathematical, but then switches to beer glasses uh, and then talks about chocolate at the end. Um, because what we're really doing here is a kind of self-similar scaling thing. Um, you've learned about similar triangles, I think, in school and scaling triangles, where it doesn't really matter if you double everything, uh, then the area goes up by a factor of four. Um, there's something similar going on with uh, the beer glasses, for example. Um, if they're exactly cylinders, uh, then it'd be something like pi r squared h, which is not in the video because it's too complicated, I guess. Um, uh, but if you make r and h each bigger by a factor of x, then because the r is squared, you get that factor of x cubed. Um, so that gives you the same the same number. Um, it's, it's a kind of a fact about scaling and the fact that we live in three dimensions rather than a fact about cubes themselves, uh, which is something I quite quite like. Um, yeah, there's like a geometric re representation. Uh, I agree with that. Um, the cube thing is really nice. Um, I'm not sure I can show you a video right now, but um, uh, there is there is a nice nice resource out there that I'm aware of. Uh, I might. I'm going to get a link to you. Uh, well, maybe someone can find it. No, that's too that's too open ended. Okay, we're not live yet. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go back to uh, back to the uh, screen like this. Um, and I'm so it's chat, and it's really clearly says we've not started yet. We're just chatting, and I'm going to do some chatting. Um, and I see the comment about I see the question about Uruguay, but I just want to find this um, enrich. Oh, there's a really good difference of two cubes. Video on enrich. Can I find it? Two cubes? No. Oh, it's quite hard to find things on the internet these days because there's so many things. Find the difference. Two cubes in video. No, cannot find it. Okay, maybe someone better at search than me can find this. Um, somewhere on the Enrich website, there's um, something about putting cubes together in a in a video. Uh, ah, I found it. No, I, I, I win. I win. I win. Okay, link going in chat. Um, uh, link going in chat. I describe it quite vaguely as well. How uh, do I get back into the event? Gosh, Slido doesn't really make it easy for you, the event organizer, to log into your own event. Um, okay, cool. I posted it. I posted it as an anonymous person. There you go. That's how hard it is to run this Slido. There you go. Um, which is a link to something about building cubes. Uh, are we meant to do this papers before watching the stream? You can if you like. Um, I think doing the papers before the stream gives you a little bit of a sort of head start. So I've now got cubes all over the office. Um, gives you a little bit of a head start because you've had your chance to try the questions before I tell you the answers, which I think is probably a good idea. Um, but don't worry if you haven't done that. Uh, there's loads more past papers, and I think just seeing questions happen is a good idea. Uh, ah, right, so a Uruguay question, let's go. Um, if you're a UK student and if you hold UK nationality, um, the rules are really complicated. Uh, let me link you to the uh, UK CISA page. Um, which I think, let's see if I can find the right one. Um, yes, so I'm going to link you to the page with all of the rules on because it, it, it's really complicated how student visas work. Um, uh, if, you're asked, if your question is not answered on this website, which I'm going to also, I guess I'm describing it, but I've put it in a reply, so it's a bit hard. Um, but people can search for UKCISA if they want to find out rules for 
and international students and please status. Um, yeah, and once again, that's UKCISA. Um, um, yeah, it, it's really complicated. And I, I, it's also not something that I necessarily work on that often. It's kind of not my not my speciality. Um, yeah, so someone's asking in chat. A post citizen, okay, right. Um, oh, they say they pay home fees. So you're currently a university student, tuning in or something, okay, fine. Or maybe you're about to pay home fees or something. Um, the Grunge Mechanics is, I believe, buried in there somewhere in one of the kind of classical mechanics courses, I think, uh, as an option, and I would guess third year. Uh, naturalized legal and UK citizen, international students, and UK natural citizens. Uh, complicated. But no, wait, I, have, hmm, I don't really know what naturalized means. Can you tell that I'm doing pretty poorly on the fee status questions? Makes me want to try and get in and get in and do some of these. Uh, oh, someone says thanks for the streams. Going to be doing maths at Pembroke starting in October. I will see you around. Uh, please do say hi. Um, normally, what people do if they've uh, normally what people do if they've seen the live streams and then they see me in Oxford uh, is that they uh, sort of awkwardly smile and it's clear that they've seen something, but. Uh, <laughs> People are not very good at saying, I saw your streams in person, but, which you can do. That, that's the phrase that you should use. And yeah, cool. Good, right. You can be on the show at some point if you like. Right, good. The key building thing was good, says Earth. You see, we're linking people to good videos. Um, if you want to find it, you can search for Enrich325. Uh, is that the best way to find it? That is the best way to find it. <laughs> right, hi, Oscar. Um, in a minute, we're going to go um, back to going live soon so we get a clean start. Um, so that it's obvious for people fast forwarding when we when we've started. Um, but just quickly before we go there, oh, someone says they love mechanics. Should I try and find the classical mechanics? Oh, I can just have a go at finding the classical mechanics course to see if it's Lagrangian enough for you or something. Uh, what I've done is I've gone to courses.maths.ox.ac.uk, which is um, where we keep all of our lecture notes and descriptions of all the courses that make up the maths degree. Um, I'm just searching the word Lagrangian on that page. It's got a search tool. I just found their courses, but I, maybe it was only searching the titles, and maybe I've spelled Lagrangian wrong. I'm going to say classical mechanics. <laughs> Search don't work if I can't spell. Wait, in classical mechanics. So it's B7.1. Yeah, B7.1. The answer is yes. Uh, which college should I apply to? Which college should I choose if I want to meet you? Good news, I work in the department, which is where the maths lectures happen. Um, I sometimes get to say hello to all of the new students, so that's going to be fun. Uh, I currently work at New College as well, uh, but you shouldn't base you shouldn't base which college you apply to based on where somebody does their teaching. For example, I'm currently contracted to do teaching with New College for this year, and I don't know if or where I'll be teaching the year after that. Uh, so, okay. Uh, and this person in chat asked me about being stateless, and again, I don't know about fee status, it's really complicated. Um, I think if you get UK citizenship, then things get a lot easier. I think being state... Oh, oh they say they are paying home fees. Okay, good, right, good, okay. You can do an open application and roll the dice. If you make an open application, we will roll the dice and assign you a college, at which point, hey, no, who knows? <laughs> You might get assigned a college where I'm doing some teaching, which might be the best or worst thing that you want. <laughs> That's what happens if you roll dice, right? You either get the thing you wanted or the thing you didn't. Okay, I think it's time to switch. Um, for the benefit of the people fast forwarding through the video, I think we're gonna switch to live scene. Uh, the screen's gonna go blue, uh, but don't worry, we're not going anywhere. Uh, thanks, thanks for being with us. Uh, in a minute, we're gonna get going with some maths questions. Uh, and for people who missed it, I'm not very well prepared today. I'm going to try and go uh, as well as I can. Good, right. Uh, okay, so I need to go to live scene for the benefit. Hello and welcome to the Oxford Map live stream. My name is James, and yes, it did just go quiet for a bit as I got finally ready to actually start the live stream. We did a little pre-live section, which is now finished. This is now the Oxford Map live stream. Let me check how you're doing today. How was your How was your day today? Um, in chat um, at slido.com/matlive, you can let me know how your day was. And people have jumped in to tell me that the day was okay, which is nice to see. I think the first three votes there were three, four, and five, which is a, a good sequence. Um, in chat, uh, oh, Patika, you did tell me how to pronounce your name last week. I think I've 
I think I've got it. Um, Fadiga says there's the normal hypothesis testing all day. I'm ready for a change of scene. I don't know if normal hypothesis counts as like a five star thing or something. Um, I guess you could analyze for me whether this graph is, is that, is that normally distributed? Who can say? Fadiga can say. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jay wants to know about teacher references. Um, obviously, you don't write your teacher reference. Uh, you guess referee writes that reference. Um, we usually get information about what your um, school... Um, usually, it says that you're keen on maths. Um, and uh, usually, it tells us a little bit about um, your school, um, if you're in a school. Um, teachers often tell us a little bit about how, how in, in this school, um, we have only been teaching further maths for a couple of years, or we actually we have loads of people doing further maths, it's brilliant, and this is our best student, which means either of those. So that's pretty cool. Um, Fatiga, yeah, we got there. Yeah, okay, okay, um, good, right, sorry, I've got a pronunciation guide in chat. Uh, predicted grades from A to A star, so five star day, six if you count the A star. Good. Um, we've got um, Anonymous in chat has done the 2011 paper just today. That's always good to see. Um, I haven't done the 2011 paper today. Sometimes when we do a live stream, um, I've done the paper before and sometimes I'm just sort of going for it. Um, what I could do is stall for time uh, so that I don't have to do very much maths, um, but that sounds rubbish. Um, so I, I think what instead I'm going to do is get right on with it so that uh, I can do as much maths as possible. As I say that, as I say that, I realise I haven't set my stream up. That's the thing I've done pretty Cool, talk amongst yourselves for two seconds. You can't do that. That trick only works when there are people in person in the same room as each other. I hope you enjoyed talking to yourself for two seconds. Um, <laughs> this is the horror of being about to write and realising that I haven't plugged in the thing that allows me to do that. Cool, right, okay. Uh, a digger. Yeah, I'm still not, I'm still not there. Maybe you are in the same room. Is anybody in the same room as somebody else? Is anybody watching this in kind of stereo on two different devices? That'd be probably pretty horrible. Um, uh, somebody's got a request for me to not do some math questions, which is uh, a bit of a first, I think. Um, uh, don't worry, the mo most recent ones, we're doing them in order. So if you're saving like the 2021 test as a past paper or something, then we're, we're not gonna get to it yet. We're working through them kind of in order. Uh, predicted grades. Uh, you're going to get your predicted grade changed. Okay, uh, to be on track. Uh, someone watch all the streams and see the central limit. I'm not sure. So if you work on the average, I think that does the central limit kind of thing, right? The average of the samples. So if you write down the average of every, per if you write down the average from each week, then I think the distribution of those averages goes to the central. Does the central limit thing? I think you can't just. Oh no. Uh, I'm hazy on the central limit theorem. Luckily for me, there's no statistics on the mat, so I'm not going to be required to do any. Um, we're going to look at 2011 for the first hour, I think. Then we're going to take a quick break at six o'clock before looking at the 2012 paper. I would like to talk about question number... Ooh, what would I like to do first? Um, I'm going to let you pick. I'll start talking about a short question, but in chat you can currently vote for whichever questions you want to do. This one looks good. Um, so here um, I've got, uh, this question is from the olden days, so it's written in radians. Uh, these days it would be in written in degrees, but hopefully it's clear what we're supposed to do. And we've got an equation that we're trying to solve. Um, it is very tempting to come in here and do something like a sine squared plus cos squared kind of thing, um, because I can see all these even powers. I can see uh, all these things involving sines uh, and cosines. Those are my, uh, the times when I want to look at uh, things like that. Um, I suppose if I'm being clever, I can see a different way to do this. Um, but let, let's start writing out what, what I might be considering doing, which is something like sine to the 8x plus 1 minus sine squared x to the 3 equals 1. Um, I suppose I can sort of see that the 1's going to cancel on both sides, which makes me happy. Um, uh, and then there'll be a lot of sine squared terms. Um, I can sort of see how many. I'm going to multiply that cube. I can sort of see the sine squared is going to be a factor. Um, that makes me happy because finding factors helps me, you know, break down the problem and actually get towards a solution. Um, I've got a funny feeling that those are going to be all of the solutions. Um, maybe in chat you can see why. Yeah, so in chat, behind the poll, people are still talking about the central limit theorem. It's on sample means. So what's your sample, right? Not just the mean of... Maybe it's the sample. Maybe the sample is each week or something. Uh, 
Nick's asked about timed papers. So I, I think I wouldn't do timed papers yet. Um, my opinion is that um, uh, when people say timed paper, they normally mean at the end of the time I'll stop. Um, and I, I don't think you should stop. Um, I think you should keep trying to do the problems. Uh, worse, people might say at the end of the time, I'm going to look at the answers and mark my own attempts. I think marking your own work is really hard to do. And it means that you've ruined those questions because now you've seen the answers. Um, so I think at the moment, your strategy should be something like maybe make a note to yourself after two and a half hours, what happened in those first two and a half hours. Uh, but I think you should keep looking at the, uh, looking at the questions or, or even not timing yourself at all, just doing maths. Uh, there is another robot, robot, the robot, the robot, robot, the robot. Um, good. Okay. I have this kind of different idea. So we could multiply this out. Um, I kind of, I back us to be able to multiply this out and get something involving sine squares. Um, and it's not going to be too bad because the science, a factor of sine squared will cancel and we'll have a cubic. We could even write down what that cubic is in terms of sine squared. I'm trying to do this out loud because I, I think this method is going to be a little bit messy. Uh, I'm probably not going to fit on the screen and I'm also not going to do it. Um, there's this alternative approach where I kind of remember that this looks a bit like, this looks a bit like sine squared plus cos squared on the left. That's a fact that I know. So maybe I should try and compare these terms to sine squared and cos squared. Obviously, if, if these things match up exactly, then we're all good. Um, if these things match up, then I think it'll still be one. Um, but in general, something else might be going on. Uh, I sort of think that these things, sine and cosine, make me think of things between um, minus one and one, which means that because I've been thinking about powers recently, when you do this, these large powers, you get quite a small thing. So I'm a bit surprised that it could add up to one. Um, yeah, is that one three three one pattern? Someone's put in chat uh, for voting under there. Okay, uh, voting is ongoing, but I think we might have got the votes that we're going to get. That's uh, interesting. Some short questions have done quite well there. I haven't found a good way to look at the answers to the poll. Oh no, five has five has won the poll. I can't read. <laughs> I'll come back to that in a second. Our oh, five to the robot questions. That's nice. Um, ah, can I move the poll because it's on top of the questions? That is a good point, isn't it? On top of the thing I just wrote. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so sketching graphs seems like it could be a good idea as well. Um, I like that suggestion in chat as well. I guess what I'm really thinking, like the place I was trying to lead you to before I started writing underneath chat, is that um, I guess sine to the 8 is less than or equal to sine squared um, because um, sine squared itself is somewhere between 0 and 1, and we've taken that thing and raised it to the power of 4, which means making it smaller, multiplying it by four, sine to the six, and sine to the six is um, somewhere between zero and one. Um, so I'm a little bit suspicious of this fact, right? I'm kind of following my suspicion. I came in with thinking, hmm, it looks a bit like thought bubble. Hmm, it looks a bit like uh, sine squared plus cos squared is one, but actually I know that these things are true. These things over here, sine squared and cos squared add to one, the way I'm going to get these to add up to one is if the well, hang on, they, haven't they both got to be equal, right? So I've got to have, I think I must have. Uh, when do when do these things when is when is this equality equal? I'm going to change color just a circle, I think, to highlight it, right? When are, when are these equal? Um, I guess that's equal when sine squared is. Uh, let's write out when sine flex equals. Sine squared x, sine to the eight x equals sine squared x, and cos the six x equals cos squared x. It's kind of a suspicious equation, right? Because sine squared plus cos squared would be one, and then just saying you've multiplied each term, you've made each term smaller, and it's still one. Well, maybe okay, it's not actually, um, not actually perhaps smaller um, if these things are actually equal. Um, and they, these things simplify down quite nicely. Uh, so that first one reads sine to the six x equals one, and the second one reads uh, or sine squared x equals zero. I've got to be careful when I divide, right? Um, and the second one says cos the four x equals one or cos squared x equals zero. Um, and that is now a system where I can start to interrogate that and say, aha, um, I should look at points where one or both of the cosine or sine equations are, are zero, which is every, every 90 degrees. Um, so I should look out for cases like that. Uh, okay, so I think the solutions are going to be something like 0 degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees. Oh, these are the cases, by the way, where one of these terms is exactly 1 and the other one is exactly 0. 
uh, keep adding 90. Uh, and then they've ruled out 360 degrees from that. So I think my answer is four solutions. This one. Picked out the question that I thought looked plausible. Um, yes, good, okay. Um, ah, good, and if you want to see the cubic method of multiply this thing out, I've just checked the web solution on the Mac website, and it's not that bad. It's about as bad as you're imagining. Um, multiplying stuff out, rearranging it, uh, using some polynomial facts. Cool. Uh, so Hasra in chat. Oh, it's not there. Uh, yep. Uh, people in chat. I agree. Uh, this is A-level mathematics. Um, good. Okay. Um, there's a question as well about whether... Um, Recent math, math, maths, math papers are harder using this. I'm really sure. Um, I think they're all pretty hard. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to turn the poll back on really quickly just so I can see. Uh, but let, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. That seems fair. Um, <laughs> let's talk about it. Um, before I just, I'm afraid. I had this when I was a student as well. Um, I, I'm always really keen to um, just move on, uh, to just do a question and then immediately move on. Uh, I should reflect, right? And Herb in chat is encouraging me to reflect as well. Um, with this question, how did I? How would I spot the inequality method? Um, I think I've been caught out by things like this before, where I'm really keen to just jump in and do a method that's familiar to me with like some sort of substitution and rearranging and polynomial stuff. Um, and I'm trying more these days when I see an equation to try and imagine whether I believe this or not. Um, and maybe this is a good thing that you should do when you see an equation too. Uh, can you think of any solutions when you first see it? Um, if I thought like that, then I would have noticed that, oh, okay, this thing could be one and that thing could be zero. That's how you make one, right? Um, because I know that sine could be zero and cos could be zero. Sine could be one and cos could be zero, that's allowed. Um, and then I might actually spot that the zero one thing works as well. And in fact, if I'm careful, I'll have found all of the solutions. Uh, I won't know that I found all the solutions. Um, but just messing around with the equation at the top, that's something I'm trying to get better at. Um, it means that as well as jumping into the algebra, I'm also looking at it quizzically to think, can I say anything about, um, about the sizes of these terms? I've seen a separate math question from a while ago. I can't remember, did we do this a couple of weeks ago perhaps where um, the trick is that, uh, yes, this was a week or two ago, uh, where uh, it was an equation with things on both sides, uh, they were both trigonometric functions, um, but the things were only equal in a very special case, because the left-hand side was uh, always less than or equal to, I think, the number four or something, and the right-hand side was always greater than or equal to four, uh, or something like that, or maybe the other way around. So they were like, only equal in the kind of extreme case, uh, they both, both like that. Um, why was it sine to the six and cos to the four? Um, I took these equations, uh, sine to the 8 sine squared, cos to the 6 cos squared, uh, and I've divided both sides by cos squared, or, or sine squared. Um, so I'm taking this one divided both sides by sine squared, um, so this why, that's why there's this or sine squared equals 0 clause, um, because I'm being careful. Um, there's also something down here about cos, cos to the 4 or cos squared equals 0. Um, cool. Uh, so there's this kind of careful tracking through. Uh, I guess I'm comparing these to a particular thing. Could I compare them to 1 and 0? No, I don't think that helps, because if I say they're both less than or equal to 1, it's kind of a true fact, but not helpful, uh, because 1 plus 1 is 2. Welcome to the Oxford Matt live stream. Um, but the right-hand side is, is 1, so you're kind of showing that the left-hand side is less than or equal to something that's bigger than both sides. Sine squared plus cos squared is a good thing to think about when you see something with sines and cosines and powers. Yeah, I get it. Uh, right. Anything else for Matt? I, I'm a big believer in just doing anything else that you find difficult. Um, anything else that makes you stop and think, um, I have quite a wide attitude to what that might be. Um, anything else that makes you stop and think is probably helpful for that. Uh, anything you can do straight away, or that's just practice for you, uh, is unlikely to be that helpful, because uh, probably a lot of the maths that we're talking about here, like squaring, you know, you're just really familiar with. So how much how much faster can you get at squaring, right? Not much faster. Uh, but being stuck on things and having ideas, uh, you can get experience with that, which is known in a huge variety of places. Uh, good. An anonymous person says, I see, thank you. And because they're anonymous, I have no idea what they were responding to. Good, right, okay. There's people in chat suggesting questions, so I'm going to switch the poll back on. Oh no, that's the how was your day? Technical difficulties. There we go, okay. More voting, um, but it looks like question five is winning. So I'm going to go and get ready to talk about robots. If you'd like to vote in the live chat about what I'm doing next um, after robots, 
I like the way that there are some multiple choice questions in there. G and E, what the G and E? Let me have a quick look. Oh, G has got this nice integral in it. Well, not that, not that nice. Probably that's why people want to do it. Um, e is, I've, I've done this one before. I'm laughing because it's quite a lot of work. Just, I'm not sure I can remember a good way. So if I do this one, it's going to be a live attempt at finding a good way to do the question. I imagine I'll probably find a bad way to do the question. Um, I think the robot was doing quite well as well. And people like three too. Interesting. Okay. I think we talked about three on the live stream, right? Someone let me know in chat. Did we talk about three in the live stream this year? I feel like we might have. It's my three B squared minus one. Feels vaguely familiar. Right. So if there's a video from a few weeks ago where we talked about this one, then I'm not that keen to repeat myself unless I have to. Uh, why does Matt have multiple multiple choice questions? Feels wrong. Hmm. Surprisingly easy to write multiple choice questions in a way that, I mean, I don't mean like easy, like you just make them up. I mean, um, easy to make the sort of questions that we want to write to set them as multiple choice questions. It's easier than I thought it would be. Good, right there, robot, Robert the Robot has one again. Uh, good. We talked about two, three, and four already. Wow, this must be my favorite year or something. I, mean, I didn't, even, didn't even know. Okay. It's question five. It's got some reading for us to do at the top. I'm going to keep chat like that while we do the reading. I hope that's enough pixels. Uh, I think I'm broadcasting in 1080, which means there's roughly a million pixels of mathematics being broadcast at you. Um, so goodness knows how many of them are useful. Not these ones, that's for sure. Uh, uh, grade, grade boundaries are adjusted, not based on not based on year 13 results or anything, but just we don't even have grade boundaries in the map. We just look at everybody's scores which means if everybody found the test easier or harder, then it wouldn't really matter because we're looking at everyone's scores normalized. Sorry, now I feel like I'm mentioning the normal distribution too much. Uh, we've done six as well, this is the best paper. Best paper. Uh, soccer toe stuff. Right, okay. Cleverly, yeah. This is my favorite sort of comment, right? Sorry, just catching up on chat. Isn't E just just an application of soccer tower and then a sign rule? So just, just a two-step process after, so a three-step process. After cleverly relating the radio and shared, shared side lengths. So just a three-step process, one of which you've described as cleverly. That makes me very nervous about doing E in a second. What do you have to get in the map? Uh, more the better, um, but we look at everything else as well. Um, so it's not a hard cutoff, and we, we do look at the rest of your application. Um, good. Uh, okay. Oh, you drew another radius. Okay, people are telling me how to do a geometry question, which is very, very kind of you. But first, I need to tell you all about this robot. It's a weird job, but that, that that's what's happening. Um, okay, question five. Uh, there's an n by n grid, um, which is what you think it is, n rows and n columns. Oh, a chessboard with an eight by n grid, good, good, good. Okay, a uh, semi-grid is the lower left part, on or below the diagonal. Um, here is a semi-grid size four. Okay, good. So I've done a lot of reading, but it's describing uh, a triangle. I am aware of triangles, so I am happy so far. Um, let's suppose that robot is located in the lower left corner of the grid. There it is, R for Robert, which is my name for all the robots. Um, the robot can only move up or right, and its goal is to reach one of the goal squares, Okay, uh, uh, which are on the diagonal. Okay, it's trying to get to the diagonal. It's the only thing it wants. In the example, if you can see the triangle in the square, those are gold squares are shown grey. It's called solution, a sequence of the robot, ro robot's moves that leads the robot from the initial location to some goal square. My goodness, okay. So solution is a sequence. Underline that. Solution is a sequence. Cool. Um, write down all eight solutions. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to introduce some notation here just so I can fit it in. Um, so I'm going to say something like write. Um, uh, what do I want? Um, R for right uh, and U for up. And they've told me how many there are. They've told me there are eight. Um, so I've got to describe how the robot's going to get to a gold square. I think it makes sense to work systematically. Um, first thing I've thought of, which I'm going to roll with, is to work from this gold square upwards. So I could work from where it is and work systematically about the different routes it could take over here. Um, but I'm going to work, how's it going to get to this square? And how's it going to get to this square? And then I'm hoping that it kind of forms some sort of pattern or something. That'll be all right. Good. I think it's two to the end, but I think I'm skipping the questions a little bit. Okay, so it could go one, two, three, like this. So right, right, right. So that, that's what we want, like a sequence of moves. Um, or it could go right, right, up, up, right, right. Oh, sorry, those are two. Uh, 
uh, or I suppose it could go right up right to get to that goal square. Or it could do to get to this goal square. Oh my gosh. I'm happy that I've got four so far, having considered half the squares. That's kind of a symmetry thing, right? Um, yeah, I'm going to take the other ones and just flip all the R's and U's. I hope that works. I'm going to check this, but I'm flipping all the R's and U's. U, U, U sends it up. U, U, right sends it there. And then now that's good. Right, U, U sends it right, U, U. Um, and U, right, U sends it to that goal square. Good. Okay, so my flipping did work. I got halfway and then thought I could use a kind of symmetry switchy thing. Importantly, I also checked that it worked before moving on. Um, uh, 8 to the power of 2. I just felt kind of like 1, 3, 3, 1 ish. I wouldn't write that on my actual test. Um, good, okay. There is a bit of English comprehension in there, isn't it? Isn't there? Uh, about understanding the grid, I suppose. Um, it uh, looks like kind of tree, two choices at the junctions. Yeah, okay, people in chat kind of agreeing with me as well. Oh, is it just two choices? Could I have done this systematically? Is that just every sequence of rights and ups of length three? It is, isn't it? That's every sequence of length three. Now I feel like an idiot. <laughs> I guess I could have listed those eight things in any order. I suppose not an idiot, but now it's obvious why it's two to the end. Good, right, okay. Never a, never a, uh, never a, never a, um, Never an idiot for not spotting something straight away. If you didn't spot it straight away, it's probably not obvious, right? There's one route that ends up here, there are three that ends up here. This is my, in my head, this is my stupid way of realising why, not stupid, again, sorry. This is my inefficient way of realising why it's two to the end, because I realised that the number of routes go one, three, three, one, which is a row of Pascal's triangle, and I know a fact that the rows of Pascal's triangle add up to powers of two. Again, all of this is me getting sidetracked. Um, so yeah, good. Okay, right. Uh, concise way of representing the possible journeys. I think we've now thought about this. Um, so maybe there's something to be said about getting distracted. Um, something to be said for getting distracted. Um, wait, hang on. Why isn't the ones of... No, like I have not understood what's going on at all. A concise way of representing the possible journeys. I've already written them down. In a semi-grid of size n. I've got a semi of size n. All the possible journeys. Oh, so some of them are like shorter or something, right? I can write right or length, right or up, and some of the journeys might be shorter and might not get it to a goal square. But in my notations, the, okay, so there's the ones of length n minus one are solutions. Okay, I'm now a little bit nervous. Um, I wouldn't recommend you do this, uh, but because the stakes are a little bit higher for me in terms of making straight mistakes, I'm going to check the web solution to see if I'm on the right track. Yeah, cool. No, okay. Yeah, I'm 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 good so far apparently. Trust myself. Yeah, the like number of routes one three three one going down here. Good. Okay. Uh, ah, a u oh a u. So Mia's notation here, sorry, is a u plus b r to mean a lots of u and b lots of r. Um, where a plus b is wait, hang on, one. Uh, why one? Do you mean n or n minus one or something? I'm not sure. Okay. Um. Uh, I've been told that the uh, there's something called a computing Olympiad uh, that has questions a bit like this, and maybe not yet, but uh, uh something called Bebras. Oh, there was a typo. Right, cool. Um, I would say for your a u plus b r notation, to me that looks like multiplication. Um, I. I hope you'd make it clear that you mean a u appears a times because it kind of appearing a times is not the same thing as multiplying it by the number a, right? Um, like a lots of three is, I don't know. You're not actually going to multiply these things together. If you did, they'd be like powers. Oh no, let's, let's not let's not go there. Um, right, okay. Formula for the number of possible solutions in a semi of size n. Haven't I already done this? What on earth is going on? Earth is going on. Which of the journeys are solutions? Yeah, it's two to the n minus one, right? I don't understand the difference between part two and part three. <laughs> Help me out, chat. What was going on? <laughs> what was I going to look at the solution? I think possibly because I looked away from it for a bit, but I looked back and yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I don't understand the difference between part two and part three. <laughs> it's still still two to the M minus one. The possible solutions? Or is it? Ah, right, sorry, this says which, and this says how many. Right, cool. So this ones of length m minus one goes here, but then the two to the m minus one goes down here. Right, okay, okay. I answered both parts in two because I got overexcited. I kind of answered part two and part three while I was rambling about part one. Whoops. Uh, I was four. Was it four? Oh, it was four. To, okay, it was briefly four. <laughs> Generalize, always generalize. Well, I don't always generalize. Um, yeah, okay, okay. So two definitely says an n, has an n in it. So people are saying part two is still talking about four. Part two is definitely talking about n. Okay, I uh, still feel I haven't totally understood why this is three parts of the question, but you know. Um, uh, part two is just devising ways to represent it, says anonymous. And then part three is what you do. Cool, I've realized once again that chat is on top of my incredible mathematics. So I'm gonna shuffle like that, there we go. Um, you heard me listing them while I was listing them. Sorry that I keep doing that. In my life, uh, chat is uh, or actually on a separate monitor from the from the screen. Uh, that's not interesting. Sorry, um, chat's like all the way over there. The screen's all the way up here. I have to remember that they're being um, they're being stacked. How am I going to remember that? I'm going to put post it. I could turn off chat again. I quite like having chat on. I like chat. Sorry for watching the replay. Fast forward a little bit while I sort, sort my life out. <laughs> Wait, don't, forward, don't fast forward too much. <laughs> I'm not going to sort my entire life out. It's going to be fine. I'll just put a post it on my screen. Good. Um, okay, change the problem slightly and redefine a goal square as any square that can be described as follows. Yes, here we go. New sort of goal. Training our robot to do something different. I like circling things. I like underlining and circling. Sorry if that annoys you. Uh, if it's not your style, then obviously. Don't have to copy me. Um, okay, lower left square is not a goal square. All right, that's a shame. Uh, each square that is located immediately above or immediately to the right of a non-goal square is a goal square. Right, okay. So not a goal square is a goal square. Immediately above or immediately to the right of a non-goal square is a goal square. And each square that is located immediately above or immediately to the right of a goal square is a non-goal square. So not a goal square, not a goal square, not a goal square, and then goal square got. This is every other diagonal. <laughs> there's a chessboard in the question. They said chessboard at the top, and now it's chessboard patterned. Okay, so this is a very long description of checkered. I don't know how to spell checkered. There we go. I guess I'm going to explain that as part of my working for part four. Um, ah, the robot on reason goal square may stop or continue moving, provided there are more allowed moves and it can keep going to the right or upwards. Okay. It may decide to keep moving. <laughs> right, what are we asked to do? Uh, with these modifications in place, run down all the solutions in assembly grid of size four and all the solutions in assembly grid of size five. Okay, I see. So in a, in, a, uh, in, in size four, um, now the goal squares are in uh, two diagonals. Uh, and I probably write a because here in my solution, and I'd write a version of the thing that I just said out, out loud, um, whereas I, I talked about it kind of diagonal by a diagonal, so starting because the bottom left corner is not a goal square, then it follows that the next diagonal is goal squares, because they're above and to the right or to the right of uh, previous the previous diagonal, and then the next diagonal is not goal squares, so the diagonal after that is goal squares. I'm not going to write all of that on the screen. Um, so, so the solutions um, are as before, because it's allowed to walk through, um, it's allowed to walk through these goal squares and keep going, um, or just go right, or just go up to get to one of these new goal squares, uh, to get to new goal. Um, okay, so 10. All of the ones, yeah. Uh, all the ones like 10. Um, how many solutions in size, same as grid of size n? Now this is interesting because um, I'm gonna have to do some addition, right? I'm gonna have to do some addition. Um, so it's gonna be something like two plus eight plus, and then there's gonna be another diagonal. Um, so this is uh, the 
way you would get to the second diagonal, the way you would get to the fourth diagonal, and then in the n is 6 case, it would be something like 2 plus 8 plus the number of ways to get to the next one out is not 16, it's 32. Um, because to get out to that, that to get out there, um, I've got to go to, I, I suppose, the n equals 6 layer, which is 2 to the n minus 1, 2 to the n minus 1 is 2 to the 5, 2, 4, 8, 6, it's 32. Um, good, okay, so for n equals 6, I need this sum, which is 42. That's not an answer for n for general. Um, for n is 7, I suppose it's also this. Um, where I would go because then there's an extra row, there's an extra diagonal, fine, but it's not gold squares. I mean, it's non gold squares. So uh, I think the robot shouldn't go there. Oh, but can, can keep walking, may decide to keep moving. Does it have to finish in a gold square? Has to stop in a gold square at the end, not just go through a gold square? Yes, of course, otherwise it could do loads of other stuff. Right, good, okay. Um, for n equals 8, I then, then get some new ones. This is a sum of uh, geometric series. And the two cases here are going to be for even and odd. Uh, for even, I'm going to add up until you get to n minus 1. So for n even, it's 2 plus 8 plus dot 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 plus 2 to the n minus 1. And for n odd, the rule is going to be that I keep going until I get to 2 to the n minus uh, 3. Two. These are two to the power of odd numbers, so I would stop at two to the n minus two. I'm thinking about the relationship between seven and five, and the fact that n you're supposed to do n minus one steps, but actually we'll only do n minus two steps because we don't want to go to the outside of that grid. I would write down some of this in my solution. Uh, those are geometric series. You can do geometric series. Uh, we did a live stream on these. Uh, good. Okay. Uh, adding them all up, it's going to be something to do with fours. Mm, can I be bothered to do that addition? Not really. Good. Okay. Homework. Use the formula for geometric progression to add things together. There's a comment in chat about um, chat delay. Um, I think I'm missing a student helper today. Um, really sorry, student helper, if you're there, uh, say hi in chat. Um, I think I'm missing a student helper, which means I'm also moderation chat, which means it's slightly slower than normal. Uh, but we can do it. Good, how am I doing for time? I'm doing alright for time. I don't know if that was helpful at all. I genuinely haven't done all of this question, I think, ever before. So my confusion is genuine. This is not an act. Gosh, it'd be good if this was an act, wouldn't it? If this kind of like baffled exterior was hiding some kind of like inner depth then uh, that would be really good for me. But nope, this is a genuine, genuine confusion on seeing a new question, which sometimes I don't do. So, you know. Okay. Uh, ah, chat is going. Checkable patterns. Uh, what does Mia say about checkable patterns? Uh, it's just the sum of the number of solutions for every other diagonal. Uh, that's even up to it. Yeah, there you go. Cool. I like that a lot. Uh, usually we manage with one student helper. So I'm kind of <laughs> trying to work out if my one student helper has logged in. They were having, I know there's been a recurring problem with uh, recurrence. Uh, there's been a recurring problem with uh, logging into Slido for the student helpers. So sometimes it's me. How many numbers in each sequence for even and odd? Good question. Um, so I'm multiplying by four each time, which is like uh, two powers of two. This, I think, uh, this one over here, so this is two to the one, then two to the three, and keep going until you get to the odd number before. So if n is equal to, if I say that n is equal to 2k, which is a good trick for when you've got an even number, if n is equal to 2k, then I believe, oh my goodness, let's be really careful. The number of terms in the sequence I think is k terms in this sequence. So let me think. So if k is 3, I've got an example over here. 1, 2, 3, sanity check passed. Um, because for each one, <laughs> n is 2k, so you write down the, the even numbers, there are k of them between 2 and 2k, and then subtract 1 from each of those, those are the powers. Woof! Um, if n is odd, then I believe you could write n is 2k uh, plus 1 or something, uh, and then, I mean, depending on your convention about how you write down your odd number, it's something super k. Roughly k. Yeah, k again. 
there is a little bit of chat lag. There is chat lag both in chat appearing, uh, chat getting approved, and then appearing on the screen again. The, the circus rotates around. Um, it's chat lay in many places. Um, I would recommend doing the sum because you know how to do it. Uh, and there's a chance that you'll get a mark for that. And in general, if you see an opportunity where something you know that's on the syllabus would be something you could do next, um, uh, let's not leave that on the table. If you've got time, if you've got time to simplify it and you're confident that you can remember the geometric series fact, unlike me, um, I just know that there's no educational merit in me getting it wrong. Like me face planting on a live stream is very fun, but it's, it's like educational value. Um, if you're in the, that situation where you see something you can do to maybe get a mark there, I can't really tell you anything other than to try and get that, that mark. Do you look at anything to do with infinity in the maths course in Oxford? Yes, every year. Um, I tell you about infinity all the time. It's great. Not like constantly, but it's time for other stuff as well. Um, but there is stuff on, uh, I guess, sequences kicks off um, pretty early on in talking about the behaviour of things as n goes to infinity. And then we talk about different types of infinity um, pretty promptly, I think, uh, moving on to pretty weird stuff in logic and set theory. Uh, if you like infinity, then I think you really like maths courses in general, uh, and I want it in, in as well. Uh, there's a request for spaced problems, uh, spaced question sheets. I did that last year, didn't I? I did spaced question sheets. Uh, I'll see. I can go on the... I've, I've got three to-do lists. I can go on the long-term to-do list, sorry. Um, if I get hit, it's not impossible, it's slightly more fiddly than it should be. Um, like a double spacing. Uh, the typesetting is slightly weird. Uh, hi, so yes, uh, and here's a good moment to reiterate this point that uh, starting in 2023, uh, the number of marks for each part will be shown in the question. Uh, uh, I've now made that, well, I've now done the official announcement in some sense, because as well as saying it on the live stream, uh, that's now on the map page. Um, so if you look at the department's map website, which is linked to from the homepage for this website, which is description, link in the description, link on screen. Um, uh, if you go there, then you can see that in writing, which doesn't really mean very much because it was me doing the writing. Uh, there are K terms in both series, Andrew, yes. Uh, is sigma notation worth the same number of marks as actually summing it? I I'm suggesting you should, to be clear, I'm suggesting you actually do the sum, like you do the work. Notation isn't work. It's usually a good idea to have some notation, but writing down some notation, you should not confuse that with actually doing maths. Uh, is there a sample paper? Uh, no. Uh, sorry. Uh, you should imagine that it says the number of marks next to each part. You can do that, yeah. Um, sorry, I know that was quite flippant. Um, uh, minimum score on that? Uh, no minimum. Uh, Normally people score, uh, normally score people score 50 or more if we're interviewing them, but yeah, stuff like that. There is a tech demo. I'm going to show it on the stream at some point. Um, don't get too excited about the tech demo. It's, it's demonstrating what it's going to look like to look at maths on a screen. Um, who can imagine what it's like to look at maths on a screen? Not like this. Maybe, maybe that, that was a, kind of a joke. Um, <laughs> this is not the format of join the live stream and James will try and draw the questions. That would be terrible. There is a practice booklet, uh, yes, being produced. Um, I sent it off to the people who run the website today. Um, so I think that the publish, pub, that gets published tomorrow. Again, I want to show you these things on the live stream too. So if you're, if you're watching this show, then you will get information. Is there a maximum score on the mat? Yes, the maximum score is 100. What's happening on the 19th of October? I think that's one of the days I'm taking off. There's a couple of dates that I'm taking off, right? 65 is sufficient? Uh, 65 is interesting. Um, no score is, technically, no score is necessary or sufficient. We look at the rest of the information. Um, 65 is kind of okay. I actually say 70 is a good score. Yeah, good, right, okay. I'm not avoiding doing questions. Uh, good, right, yeah, you're doing macro. We've got a couple of months and who knows? Maybe on the day, in the exam room, nice and quiet. Maybe that's good. Is Matt on the 19th of October? I'm not doing a live stream on the day of the test. Probably. Am I? Let me check my own schedule. This is me visiting my own website to find out what I'm doing. Uh, no live stream on the on the 19th of October. That seems sensible. Good. 
Uh, it's not as simple as private school, state school. That would be, I don't know. Uh, for only 40 people that are accepted for JMC. I don't really know what JMC is. That like Junior Maths Challenge? Joint Mathematical? Joint Maths? No, uh, Joint Schools in Maths and Computer Science. Safer private school students. Um, three blue, one brown. Some of us don't actually agree with you um, that that would be safer. I sort of know what you're getting at, I think, um, but that is not something that all of us are willing to take as red. Um, safer, interesting. So like, there's this kind of narrative, I think, that certain students might be more risky, which I just really don't have very much time for. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, and yes, that's not the actual three blue one brown. Uh, good. Okay, young carers group at school. Carers possibly he's not formally a young carer. Um, we judge these things on a case by case basis. We we don't have a kind of policy that says if you tick a box for being officially a carer, then something different happens. Um, we take it case by case anyway. Um, I'm telling you that because I think you're going to say something in your personal statement, maybe, or your teacher's reference or something, or just somehow we're going to get this information. Um, and I want to reassure you that we're going to treat that case by case uh, and look at what's going on. Uh, right, sorry, tonal shift. Um, I think I'm missing questions now, but that's probably fine. We're supposed to do some maths. I think I was talking about 1E and 1G. Let's go back and have a go at them. Um, so 1G, I think, is an example of a pretty tricky integral. I think I called it nice a second ago. Um, um, the value of f of x squared minus 1. Mm, cool. Um, so here's f of x. We can give it a picture of it. It's made of straight lines. Um, and we've been asked to do an integral. I think my strategy is to write down what this thing is um, and then try and work out what f of x squared minus 1 really is. If I was being clever, I'd probably think about uh, the range of values of the kind of domain of like, what, what numbers we're putting into f. There's loads of thumbs up for a Matt live stream about going through the test. Um, I'm going to do a live stream about the test. I'm not doing it the day after. Um, I have learned from recent years that I should give it a bit of time. Uh, yeah, so if you if it just said f of x, then we would write down the area of that triangle. Um, so I'm kind of with you. And the area of that triangle is one, so which is not an option. So uh, boom. Uh, we write down who you edited your comment as well. I oh, know you're good. Um, one's not an option, so I'm going to be okay. Um, uh, good, okay. Um, if I really concentrate, I can realize that x squared minus 1 is actually between minus 1 and 0, which means that half of the stuff I'm about to tell you is not useful, but let's do it anyway. Um, so over here, uh, we've got if... Uh, minus 1 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 0, then um, f of x is equal to, and I've got to write down the equation of this line, um, which seems to have gradient 1 because it goes up by 1 over a change in x of 1, um, and it goes through uh, x, it goes through minus 1. So I'm going to write down, I'm going to write down the expression x plus 1 because that's what I believe that equation is. Uh, and over here, I'm going to write down if uh, x is between 0 and 1, then f of x is equal to, what is this going to be? It's the same thing with a negative gradient, isn't it? 1 minus x. Brilliant. Okay. Um, half of that is useless um, because, in fact, x squared minus 1, the thing we're actually going to plug into at f, we're not plugging in just kind of raw numbers x, we're plugging in this expression x squared minus 1 um, between minus 1 and 1. Right? x is going between minus 1 and 1. That means that x squared minus 1 is going between minus 1 and 0, which means that in that range, f is just the rule, take the number that you're given, and add 1. I think it's helpful to think of f here as a rule about what happens. You give me an input and I add 1 to it. Okay, in this expression it's written that with x's, which is maybe confusing because x means something different on here, but this is a rule. This says that if you give me the letter a, I'm going to add 1 to it. If you give me the number 2, I'm going to add 1 to it. If you give me the a kind of like small picture of a stick figure, I'm going to add 1 to it. Well, I'm going to try to anyway. Um, so whatever you give me, I'm going to add 1 to it. Right, okay, we wrote it out here with x's because there was an x in this picture. Um, but that, that x is kind of different, right? It's the x for that picture. Um, so we could come up later and do something different. And um, the rule says just add 1, um, which means that what we're asked for is to add 1 to this expression, uh, which is just maths, I think, um, which I believe is 2 thirds. 
Uh, let me do it properly. Uh, yeah, too fast. Cool. Uh, well, so the graph of f of x squared minus 1 is a bit um, interesting, right? Or is it? Is it interesting? I think it's interesting. Yeah, well, it's interesting outside of that range, right? So f of x squared minus 1 is something like, oh, that's under chat. The post-it saved me. Um, f of x squared minus 1 is something like this. Um, nice quadratic out here, but then when the, when the argument gets a bit larger, uh, this thing switches to being uh, 1 minus the thing that you put in. Um, so if this thing is large, if, this is a good question by the way, who asked this? Uh, an anonymous person. What, is the, what does the graph? Uh, good question. Um, if this thing is greater than 1, then the expression is going to be like this, 1 minus the thing that you put inside, rather than 1 plus. 1 minus the thing that you put inside, write it out correctly please, is 2 minus x squared. Come on, I can do this. I'm just going to come down like that. Um, so the function is pretty cool. It's like a it's kind of devil horn kind of shape. Um, but the bit with the range we're integrated between minus one and one, where it's just a sort of quadratic. Does it kind of weird? Please explain why you added one. Why do I add one? Okay, so f is really complicated, right? Is this chevron shape or whatever these are called? Kind of hats. Uh, I don't know. Um, but in this particular range between minus one and zero, so just focusing on this range, if you just look at here, you put the kind of blinkers on, um, and you just look at that range then in that range, the function looks really nice. It's just x plus 1. So if the argument, if the number that you're putting in, this is the number that we're putting in, if it lies in that range, uh, then the function is just a straight line. And that straight line is just add 1. Uh, I'm not moving any limits around. Uh, I'm just evaluating f. Uh, so the plus 1 just comes from the idea that in that region, f is really simple. It's just the number x. It's just the function x plus 1. Uh, take take the input, whatever it is, and add 1 to it. Um, that's the equation of this straight line, right? So this is, if we agree this is a straight line, uh, then maybe you at home would like to check that uh, it, this straight line has gradient 1 and the constant, the y-intercept, is 1. Um, so it is y equals x plus 1. Um, uh, homework. Uh, if we change some of the numbers on this picture, uh, then you can get different answers out. <laughs> you can get more complicated answers. Uh, good. It does look like little ears, doesn't it? So which is nice. Uh, am I going to problem solving matters event in late September? Yes. Uh, hi, Canon. Right, so uh, there's a suggestion in the chat to draw x squared minus 1, which I think I like. Um, let's draw x squared minus 1. I'm going to do it down here. Um, so you'll notice that between minus 1 and 1, where the roots are, this function is negative. But it only gets down to being as, as negative as minus 1. That's where the turning point is for this function. Um, so I can say that in the range, minus 1 to 1, in that range, the function x squared minus 1 is pretty controlled. It's between minus 1 and 0. Um, that means that the only part, f, that matters, the only bit where we're actually asking the value of f, is when x squared minus 1 takes a very really narrow range of values. Uh, we're taking the integral from minus 1 to 1, correct? We're taking x from minus 1 to 1. But x isn't the thing that we're plugging into f in this expression here. x plays a role, sure. x is important, but it's not the number that's being given to the function f. Remember, the graph that we drew above is what would happen if you took the variable x and you gave it to f and you plotted the output. It looked like a hat. Lovely. Um, but that's what, that's what happens if you give the variable x. We're not giving the variable x. We're not giving it the numbers minus 1 up to 1. We never give it, in the process of doing this integral, from minus 1 up to 1, we never give the number 1 to f. You might think we do, because it says 1 up here, right? That's when x is equal to 1. x is the variable we're integrating with respect to. x is going to be 1 up there. But look, when we plug in 1, we do 1 squared over 1, that's 0. And then 0 is the number inside brackets that we pass to the f. So f doesn't see the fact that, oh, the integral has got up to 1. The f just sees the number that you're passing to it, which is 0. Good. OK. Uh, Oxford doesn't take part in UCAS clearing. 
uh, sorry, um, I predicted grades. Oh, oh, predicted grades, fine, we still need to do the map, sorry. Congratulations on your predict predicted grades. Yeah, so it's very different from f of x, then square it, then subtract one. That's very different. So homework question, uh, compare and contrast uh, with f of x squared minus one, which is really different. And the graph of that function is, yeah, really, really different. Might use this on a polynomials worksheet next year. Feels like a good thing. Uh, someone in chat wants to do a substitution. Uh, I think f of g of x makes it look quite complicated. Um, Tika says, uh, cool thing described history is similar to calculus. And we look at history as a ser series of events, but actually infinitely small events. Unidentifiable. I like that kind of continuous, continuous change. Uh, extensive list of competitions that they've won. I have not won any competitions. Extra courses they take part in. I have not taken any part in any comp not taken part in extra courses. All successful applicants, this successful revolve. Nope. Cool, good. Okay. Uh, my personal statement does talk about doing maths competitions. It does not talk about how they went. <laughs> because that's not important, right? That's what I tell myself anyway. I've allowed myself seven minutes to do this question. It's absolutely perfect. Credit on one equals zero. One equals zero? Yeah, okay. Trapezium rule history. I use Simpsons rule on my history courses. Um, right, good. Um, okay, what have we got? We've got a circle. It's question 1E. You voted for this. Um, you voted for seven minutes of, of geometry, so that's what we're going to do. Um, the thing that I really want to mark into this picture is the radius to this tangent, because I know some facts, right, about radius and tangent. Um, that just kind of feels like I can just kind of see it, right? Um, there's a flashcard. One of the map flashcards has a uh, a circle and a tangent. Um, if you don't know what a map flashcard is and you would like to find out a uh, website, link in description, you can get some flashcards to help you revise math. Uh, right, and we've got some kind of similar, these lines are the same because they're both radii. Goodness me, the angles alpha, beta, gamma are related by an equation. Oof, don't know about this. Um, what do I want here? So I think I want to do something that uses angles and sides because what have I got? I've got a bunch of sides that are either shared between the two triangles, I can see two triangles, um, or that have that same radius in them. And I know a fact about um, triangles that uses angles and sides, which is the sine rule. It's quite tempting to write down components, um, to just sort of write down the coordinates of where everything is. Maybe I'll call this point the origin and then work out like oh my goodness what's this angle above the above the horizontal and um, I think if I write down some angle side length stuff okay so I'm going to give these names I'm going to call this r for radius uh, I'm going to call this length that I don't know x that looks relevant because it's opposite one of the angles I'm thinking about the sine rule are you Sokotoa maybe we're doing Sokotoa in this right angle triangle over here so now I can see that um opposite over hypotenuse that's sine, isn't it? I've got sine alpha is r over x, which looks pretty good. Oh, and I know another fact about fractions involving fractions involving side lengths, which is the sine rule for this top triangle, right? The sine gamma over x is equal to sine beta over r. And I think I'm now good because now I can rearrange this thing. Uh, rearranges to r over x is equal to sine beta over sine gamma. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm aiming for b, I think. Um, so then sine beta over sine gamma is equal to sine alpha because they seem to be both r over x. I don't solve for r or x, but that's fine because I could be scaling the whole diagram, so I shouldn't expect to solve for r or x. Uh, sine alpha is uh, sine beta over sine gamma. Yeah, of course, that rearranges to b, I think. Huh, I've definitely seen this question before and found it much more involved than that. Uh, sorry, that was quite fast. So lost for this question, says so someone in chat, sorry. Um, I kind of want to do it with the coordinates now to remind myself about how messy this is with coordinates. What I thought was going to happen was that I would need the sine rule for this right angle triangle. I was expecting to do something like um, sine alpha over r is equal to sine 90 degrees over x. Oh, but I suppose sine 90 degrees is 1, so that really is this fact, isn't it? The sine rule becomes Sokotoa for a right angle triangle. 
Huh, okay. Um, sorry, because I didn't uh, do this question before going on the live stream, uh, what happened there is I believed this to be a really, really complicated and involved question where I'd have to do loads of work and I didn't have much time. Uh, so I did it really quickly. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's what lack of preparation does. Uh, yeah, so loss of generality works um, if you assume the radius is one. Um, so there's no scale in the picture. This could be marked out in miles or kilometers and it doesn't matter. Um, you could invent your own units, if you like, that aren't really miles or kilometers. It's not based on the distance to the equator through Paris. It's based on this circle right here. Right? Um, so why use the standard definition of a mile or kilometer when you could be inventing the Jamesometer, um, for which this is exactly one Jamesometer. And I'm not going to write Jamesometer ever again. I'm just going to label things as this is also one. And then this X here was like. Uh, the length measured in Jamesometers uh, about how I suppose it should be RE, shouldn't it? Uh, this is the the length measured in Jamesometers of how far how far across things are relative to that standard definition. One Jamesometer is the radius of this particular circle in the picture. Um, the the more sensible way to say that is without loss of generality, the radius is, is one, like the number one. Um, but I find it helpful to think of it as uh, an invention of a new an invention of a new unit. Because uh, units don't matter, right? You, you rescale the whole thing. Besides the matter of some effect on the angles. Um, so whatever, whichever one of these is true should be true for any kind of scale of this picture. Um, so the fancy way to say it is without loss of generality. Um, the way I like to think of it is kilometers are made up, miles are made up. I can play that game. That's a Jamesometer. Right, good, okay. Uh, can I explain this again? Asks Andrew. Good. Uh, I will list the key ingredients that we've got. That's what I've got. Um, so, uh, step one, uh, we dropped a radius. Uh, and we used a right angle fact from a flashcard. Um, step two, we used the sine rule uh, to like great effect in, in both of these triangles. If you're not sure what the sine rule says, um, you should definitely learn the sine rule. Um, and you should get happy with the sine rule to the point where you... Um, see some angles and sides in a random triangle and you consider writing down the sign rule. You don't have to, but you consider it. Um, three, we've got kind of equal radii um, or shared side. So this X is secretly shared between those two triangles. So they use the same corners. Uh, and this R is the same because radius of a circle is the same on any radii, um, which kind of like relates everything together. So sine alpha is R over X. That's just a fact about this right angle triangle down here. Um, and then this thing over here is the sign rule. I, maybe I've written it upside down or, or back to front compared to how you like to write the sign rule, but it doesn't really matter. I've then rearranged it to get it kind of in the same form for this, a different expression of R over X. I guess that's one way to think of it, that the sign rule gives you a rule for the ratio of side lengths in a triangle that's not necessarily right angled. Good, uh, not Ramanujan has got a different approach for G, which I kind of like, and graph. Uh, how long is a Jamesometer in meters? Well, I don't know. Uh, it's slightly awkward because I don't know, right? Um, I don't know until I, I'm talking about this circle in the question. I don't know until we're going to measure it. Um, in, in you're saying meters, says Herb. So okay, we'll then do that. Um, but I'd like to note that Herb, in order to convert it to meters, I need to measure this circle, but you need to measure through Paris because a meter is defined as the distance from the North Pole to the equator on a line through on the Earth that uh, goes through Paris. That's ten thousand kilometers. Um, so while I'm measuring my circle, I'd like you to go and measure the Earth. I guess something I could have done on the screen to demonstrate that size doesn't matter for this circle is to just sort of zoom in and out, right? Like it's still true at this screen resolution, and it's also true at this screen resolution. Like all the angles stay the same when you do that. So, okay, I'll just zoom in until that's exactly a metre. Oh, it's going to be really large if I zoom in until it's a metre. So let's not do that. Let's stand further back and look at our geometry problem from a distance. Lots of geometry problems are like this, but you can kind of choose your own scale bar. Um, sometimes this is fun, right? You can just mark on like, this is 100 kilometers. This circle is huge. Um, doesn't matter, right? Uh, can you use Wolog? Yes, markers will know what Wolog is. Uh, that was an hour. It was kind of fast, wasn't it? I think we're doing... Are we, are we, is this what it feels like to be like a um, pretty, good, pretty good live stream? I don't know. Let us know in chat. What's a live stream like? Never, I never get to watch the live stream because I'm always on it. 
Uh, oh, yes, sorry, a meter is these days. You are correct. You get the pedantic correction. It's not even pedantic, it's just correct. Um, these days, a meter is defined in terms of the speed of light. There's nothing French about it. Uh, right, yeah, okay, I'm measuring error. Okay. Uh, any other circle theorems not on the flashcards? I tried to put the important ones on the flashcards. I am personally a big fan of the one about two angles. Uh, the one about two angles like this. I think it's just a really nice fact. You can derive it. Uh, it's not too difficult to derive it from stuff that you know about. I don't know, maybe, maybe, you, maybe you remember the one about angle at the center. Um, if you don't remember the one about angle at the center, that's even easier to derive. You just draw an extra radius in and then mark out some kind of, everything's nice little loose triangles. So how, how hard can it really be? Um, mark in absolutely everything and things fall apart. Uh, and you get this kind of double angle in the center thing. This turns out to be precisely gamma plus beta times two or something. Um, so the angles, angle in the center is double. Um, I didn't put it on a flashcard because I sort of think you can work it out if you have to. Um, this one I just really like. It just makes me happy to see the kind of like the way the angle goes around, but the point goes around, but the angle stays the same. Ah, it's just excellent. Uh, Mia says it's the first time ever live here. Yeah, it's I, uh, Mia. It's always like this. This is just what it's like. <laughs> and for the fifteen markers, do you get marks if reasoning is not the same as marks if the answer is? So it probably should. Um, uh, we like to say that any reasonable method should get marks. Um, and the markers often create new mark schemes if they see a new method that we weren't expecting to see. Um, we sometimes write out, we're getting better at these days predicting what people are going to write and writing kind of alternative marks, mark schemes for the markers. Often on the website, the web solution's just got one method. Uh, sometimes we've worked out several ways that we think someone might do the question. Um, some of them might be a bit weird. Um, we don't put all of them on the website. Get, how convincing should your answers be? Uh, convincing enough that we think that you are not bluffing. Uh, uh, also, don't bluff. <laughs> convincing enough that we think you're not bluffing, um, which means give us something, right? Give us just give me give me something. Um, uh, there are method marks, but not for multiple choice questions. Mia is correct. Uh, please, please, please explain the two circle things on the screen. Um, I'm going to move on to 2012 in a second, but I'll just give you I'll just give you one diagram for you to ponder, which is. Uh, this diagram, it's a circle. Um, this is the center of the circle, believe it or not. Um, this is the angle alpha, and this is the angle two alpha. Um, I claim that this diagram contains a true fact. Um, it's up to you to go and prove that for yourself. Um, hint, draw in, and draw in one more radius and think about isosceles triangles. Um, that's what I'm going to tell you. It's called the double angle. What is it called? Oh, it's not important what it's called. Um, the angle subtended at the center? No, goodness me. Um, please prove this at home. Um, and then reflect on the amazing fact that in your proof, it doesn't matter where you put this point. You can move it around from, from here to here, around this arc. It just doesn't matter where it is. That's really nice. Um, homework for other people watching at home who maybe ignored that bit. Um, why have I put these markers in? Why? Does it suddenly matter if you move the point over there? Now, maybe you know what the answer is in terms of the angles, um, but where in the proof does it matter if you move the point over here? The proof's going to go wrong at some point. Not obvious where. Um, you might like to think about that as homework. Um, if you know the proof, why do we restrict to only talking about this arc around here? Good, right, homework. Uh, shout out to Dan, who made the flashcard card flip. Um, I have forgotten the link for that, but maybe someone can uh, uh, get, um, maybe someone can, friendly can post a link in there. Uh, if you miss a subtle detail, it's probably fine. You might lose one mark, I suppose, depending on whether that subtle detail was worth a mark. Me or it is fine to just tick, ponder, ponder the 2D orb. Uh, I didn't really explain why a piecewise function integration doesn't work for question G. I think it does. It does work, piecewise function integration. There's just only one piece, so it's easy. I've done the one piece. Here's my, here's my piecewise function integration. That's the piece. I think we're disagreeing in chat a little bit about how many pieces you need. Ah, oh, there's a link to Dan's thing. Is Dan in chat again? It's kind of even, even better if Dan's not in chat and people are just still circulating Dan's thing. If I were Dan, that's what I'd want. I like, I like catch a live stream at some point and people are still talking about the card flip thing. People like that. Good job, Dan. Uh, okay. We've gone slightly past six. Um, please remember to take a break. Look away from the screen if you've been looking at the screen for an hour. Um, I'm going to drink some water. I'm also going to mute myself for two seconds. 
I can clear my throat, sorry. Talk amongst yourselves, chat. Right, um, you didn't hear, but I made a noise uh, like a pirate. Um, good. Why is it only one piece? Oh, right, yeah, because x squared minus one. Maybe you want four pieces. I think we all agree the pieces on the outside are not relevant. Um, because why are they not relevant? Because we never plug those numbers into f. We never plug those numbers into f. Um, think really hard. What numbers do we plug into f? Um, I claim it's only negative numbers that actually get past the f because of the pre-calculation. There's kind of some pre-processing that happens here. It's not just the number x that gets past the f. It is this expression. Um, by the way, so we all agree, right? That like if it says minus one of one of f of f of three of f dx, then I think we all agree that you don't plug in minus one to one. f of three is f of three is just a number, right? f is not looking at x at all in this example. It's just reading the number three. So we would definitely not argue about all oh, f goes from minus one to one. It would just take one. Out. f of three is just a number. I'm going to integrate that number. Um, and that's kind of what's happening here, right? F isn't really looking at these. F is looking at whatever you gave it inside the brackets. Uh, eyes emoji. Uh, F is just looking at this number in here. Um, and over here, F is just looking at the things that you give it inside the brackets. It doesn't know it's in an integral. It doesn't know what the limits are on that integral. It's just looking at the numbers you give it. Good. Okay. Right. Uh, 2012, I think. Let me reset poll. Um, and once again, I have not looked at questions before. So some of them I've come across before just because we used some of these questions uh, in previous live streams uh, and because well, it's been about 10 years since 2012 so the odds that I've come across them are uh, not zero. Uh, which ones have we talked about on the live stream? I feel like we've talked about this one vaguely recently, maybe this year, maybe last year. From rings a bell, function applications, lots of them. Uh, this one I don't think we've talked about but it's not too hard. Um, the circle balancing on top of a parabola, we've definitely talked about this one a few weeks ago. Um, on one of the, um, uh, we did these live streams on different topics, so just for the benefit of people who are joining us for the first time, um, this is not the first live stream we've done. We did a few where instead of looking at particular papers, we looked at particular topics. Um, I chose some past paper questions. This was one of them. Uh, I modified it badly. Uh, here's another Robert. Uh, I think we've talked about this, Robert, before. Yes, it was the thumbnail for computer science episode. <laughs> One of them. Uh, hats. I'm pretty sure we've talked about the hats as well. And this game, I think I talked about a while ago. Oh my goodness, we've talked about seven, six. Between this year and last year. Am I doing seven? What are we going to do? I reckon you're going to vote for... I reckon you're going to vote for two and three, maybe seven. And some short questions. Oh, and now I look at the chat. That's kind of what you're voting in. Voting for. I'm liking these short questions. Oh, and this one involves a circle with a thing at the at the at the outside. We gotta talk about this question. We gotta talk about this question. Ah, oh, people in chat telling me about circles too. But behind the pole, uh, when it goes back around, it's 180 minus alpha. That's correct. Um, you might like to think about cyclic quadrilaterals to explain this to yourself, but that won't help you understand why the proof went wrong, right? And I haven't shown you a proof really. I'd encourage you to go and do a proof. Um, the proof doesn't go wrong because of cyclic quadrilaterals, that, that's nonsense. Um, the proof has a step in it where it requires you to be on that particular arc. Two points on the same arc. Uh, you've got to spot which one it is. Uh, on one eye in 2012, it ended up in root three, but everything else was fine. Let's see if I can reconstruct what happened there um, in a second, because J is winning the poll. Two and three are doing quite well. They've actually gone slightly up in the poll since I suggested that we might want to see them. Uh, okay, so I think my plan for the next 50 minutes is I and J, I'm seeing I and J, two and three, H and, and maybe four. Okay, that sounds like a plan. Um, I kind of think sometimes we should talk about computer science questions. Maybe not right now, but I know the computer scientists, there's slightly fewer of you. Um, so this kind of democracy thing is not really fair because the majority, the maths majority, uh, uh, outvote you on things like this. But hey, we're all going to do question two. Uh, or maybe three or something. Uh, me as well, bye mail. Good, right, okay. Uh, the advantage of setting a username is that you, you get these kind of shout outs where I try and learn how to say your name. Uh, okay, we're talking about 1j because it's a good question. Um, 1j, 
key idea here. So, right, let's read the question. Um, there are two chords, QP and RP, on a circle of radius one. Oh, right, okay. Um, and they, <laughs> one Jamesometer. Uh, they meet at an angle of theta at the point P, for example, as drawn in the diagram below. Ah, okay, okay. Right. Um, so we're asked in terms of theta, these different options are in terms of theta, what's the largest possible area of the shaded region RPQ? Um, the key observation, I think, is that for fixed theta, for fixed theta, the angle at the center is also fixed. So this is the fact that we were just discussing Where's the center? Hang on, let me think about the center first. Thing. The angle at the center is two theta. Um, this is a really fantastic observation in a way because a chunk of that region is fixed, I suppose, in, in area. Um, sure, I could spin the whole picture around. That keeps the area the same. I could choose this other one with the same theta, but just spin all of PQ and R, rotate your head, and you get kind of a new picture. Um, it's pretty similar, and it's got the same area when you rotate your head um, or rotate the picture. Um, or I could do something where I move P around the outside, and that also keeps the angle theta the same. So I suppose I'm thinking, for fixed values of theta, where should I put that point to maximise the area of, oh my goodness, this kind of shared area, shared, uh, shaded region? Um, some of which, by the way, I can already see the area is kind of like this bit over here. That's something to do with theta and circle area. Um, so there's something to do with like 2 theta divided by 2 pi times pi r squared or something, if I'm using radians. Um, if I'm using degrees, then I'm supposed to write something like 2 theta divided by 360 degrees pi r squared, which is just like the same but more messy. This question was in radians. It was back in the days when we assumed everybody knew about radians, so we wrote the questions with radians. Um, cool, anyway, that's part of my answer. So I suppose back in the days of radians, these twos would cancel, and the pi's would cancel, and I'd be left with theta r squared. Oh, and r is 1. So this would just be the, the expression theta. Uh, and then plus something. So theta plus something for this area over here. Um, and that matches, well, kind of three of the four options. <laughs> um, what's my bet? I think theta is probably not zero. So I'm looking at options a and b, like theta plus something. Um, to do with sine and cosine because there's some triangles around, I guess. Um, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to maximize an area, I think. Oh yeah, largest possible area. I'm gonna make something really big, uh, large. Um, H I J says top right chat. Um, yeah, the, I think the question would be make more sense, or it'd be easier to pass if Q and R were fixed and P could move. Um, the fact that all of them can move is kind of a red herring because with that loss of generality, um, R is at the bottom. You could take wherever you put P, Q, and R, you could rotate the picture so that R's at the bottom. Um, and then I get the position of Q depends on theta, um, but once theta is fixed, that's where Q goes. So it is it's kind of the same as saying that RQ is fixed, but almost but not quite, in a way that doesn't really matter for the area. Uh, anyway, we're supposed to be making this um, area nice and large, which I believe means that we want to put this point, what's going on here? I can sort of see a triangle, I mean a triangle PQR. Right? I can sort of see a triangle. And I know how to make triangles large. It's a triangle with a fixed base. I would like to make the height large. And the way I do that is to move the point P directly above uh, the kind of uh, perpendicular bisector of the base. It's going to move P right over here, um, up to the perpendicular bisector of the base. I'm trying to move the point P really far away from the base, um, which means if you turn your head sideways, I'm trying to move, move the point P so that it's really far away from that line of QR, um, which I think means nice and symmetrically just being up here somewhere. One of the nice things about the multiple choice questions is you don't have to write down your reasoning. You just have to pick the right answer. Uh, well, let me see what we've got. Uh, I think I remember the answer, so I'm, I'm not going to skip to it, don't worry. Uh, what have I got? I want to kind of draw, draw in that particular version of the picture. 1, 1, 1, because the radius is 1. Uh, 
theta at the top. Two theta down there. How am I going to find these angles? Um, what have I got? So then this is 180 minus theta. I suppose I'm in radian mode today. So this is pi minus theta, pi minus theta. And I like to write down the area of these triangles as half times one times one times sine of pi minus theta. So pi, or you could write down 180 degrees if you prefer degrees. For the area of this triangle here, uh, that's not a great way of pointing at a triangle, is it? Let's give it a color. Cool. Um, the reason I've written all of that out with the ones and stuff is so that you can see that I'm using the expression for the area of a triangle that goes half AB sine angle. Um, and then some kind of mess around with it and you get kind of sine theta over T. Uh, and there are two of them, so I'm going to pick B because I think this simplifies to sine theta over 2 and I've got this other one on the other side. Essentially a nice symmetry thing. Uh, ah, when you test theta equals pi, they all work. Yes, so <laughs> if theta equals pi, then it's not even possible. If theta equals pi, it's the whole circle, right? Your angular p is so large that you include the entire circle and it's area pi. Um, so if you plug in theta equals pi, but they all, they've all been chosen so that that works out. Oh no, this one doesn't, does it? Oh yeah, it does, it does. They all give you pi, so it's kind of nice. Um, I haven't heard the thing that... Uh, you, you arrived in chat, so has heard the reduced number of spaces because the math and statistics department is growing. Um, what I've heard is that we're admitting maths and maths and stats joint from next year, so we're not going to offer the maths and stats course on UCAS. Um, I don't think that's got anything to do with maths and computer science, um, and I haven't heard anything about reducing. Uh, we just admitted about 45, which is roughly the same that we've made over the few, last few years. So I'd be really surprised if we reduced that by 20. Um, it was a long question. How do you prove that sine x is equal to sine 180 minus x? Oh, uh, two-step it, I think. Chat, can chat guess what my two-step is going to be? Uh, sine 180 minus x. Uh, they're quite similar steps. Uh, this is sine of... So I know this fact about 90 minus. So when I know a similar true fact, what I try to do is write down a true statement that has the form of the thing I'm trying to work towards, right? It's like aspirational. Um, I want to use the 90 minus fact. So I've written down sine of 90 minus, manifest it, right? Try and make it happen. Now I'm willing to write whatever I, whatever it takes in that bracket there in order to make this fact true. And I, I, I mean that. So what did I actually write? I clearly want an x inside there. I'm not done because <laughs> get rid of it. I'm not done uh, because I want that. that x because I want a minus x. Um, but I'm going to put a sneakily. I'm going to put another x minus ninety in here. Yeah, this is sneaky because I've chosen that number so that it balances off with the extra minus sign. Adds a ninety, becomes one eighty. So I've written out a true statement. But I've written out a true statement sort of of my choosing. I don't get to decide what truth is, um, but I don't get to decide what my statements look like um, and then make them true. Good, okay, that, this is justifying how you would decide to write down this kind of mad line, because this is a bit mad. Incidentally, when you're reading mathematics, it can be really, really hard to work out what people were doing um, along the way. So like here, this is just true. Uh, I got lucky that time, I suppose. I wanted it to flip around to be the other facts that I know, um, uh, which is this, right? Um, so I'm trying to use my 90, 90 minus facts. There's a flashcard for that, if you get the map flashcards, but it's just like something you should know on the syllabus. Um, wait, can you assume that? Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty reasonable, isn't it? Here's a 90, de here's a 90 de degree triangle, here's the angle x. It's just like definition of what sine x is, and definition of what cos of 90 minus x is. If you view, view the triangle from an angle, that's technically only a proof for acute angles, but it just works out. It's not, not an interesting thing. You would use a double angle formula. Oh, that sounds pretty really complicated. I say, some people, someone in chat says that they know an expression for this in general. Um, and if you're using the general expression, then you're missing the opportunity to use the fact that this angle is lovely and the result is nice. Um, this thing turns out to be sine theta. Um, sometimes, not always, but sometimes if the result is nice, 
then your method might be might be nice as well. Whereas uh, I also know an expression for this, and it's a bit messy. Um, so I'm giving you a wobbly face. That's not a sad face. Sad face would be if you if your idea was um, like not going to work. But a wobbly face because I'm not certain we can execute this effectively. No, actually, I, I'm pretty confident that you can actually go for it. Cool. Um, that's also not on the map syllabus, so not everybody watching knows what that is. Uh, you and I do. It's quite hard to talk to just one person. Uh, you and I do, but uh, not everybody does. Uh, if you don't know an expansion for that, you're going to learn it really soon, um, and I think you'll like it. It's a bit hard to remember, so I'm not writing it on the screen. No, I can remember it. I'm going to write it on the screen. This is not on map. This is, this is fine. You don't need to know this. It's pretty good, right? It's got cousins and signs mixed around. Um, if you look at that and think, huh, that reminds me of complex numbers, uh, then, wow, uh, you're, you're correct. Uh, it doesn't remind anyone of complex numbers, does it? Uh, people in chat voted for H and I. H is kind of famous, I think. Well, not famous in no way. I just, I've seen this question. I've, I've used this question in admissions test workshops. I'm um, so working with people to talk about admissions test questions. Um, I'd used this question in a workshop um, before I started working at Oxford, before I like, I thought about working at Oxford. Um, so this is kind of one of the first Matt questions that I grabbed. It's hard. Let's do it. Um, okay, with that, so using something like that be fine for marks on the map. Yeah, fine, go on. If we write the question so that you can do it like that, um, uh, personally, I prefer it. I prefer it when we write the questions so that you can't use A2 maths because I don't think you should get an advantage for knowing A2 maths. Um, but that's my opinion. Okay, we've got a horrible function. We're in radian world. Um, I hope that's okay with people watching. Um, if you don't know what radians are, then I hope I'm making it clear that that's sort of fine. Like, you'll learn about radians quite soon. Oh, there's so much maths that people are about to learn. I mean everyone. There's so much maths that you're about to learn. I would quite like to be teaching you it, but instead we're going to talk about sign. Um, uh, maybe at some point I will teach you some new maths. Uh, maybe I already have today. Who knows? Um, okay, so uh, sign. What do I know about sign? I know that it takes values between minus one and one. Um, so again, here's another test of our integration skills. Um, the integral t goes from t equals 0 up to t equals x. Now the inside inside sign, that's taking its argument, its argument is t. So the inside one is going to see a uh, kind of like a sine wave that goes from 0 up to, I don't know what x is, x is just something between 0 and 2 pi, but whatever it is, this inside sign is going to see all of those values, um, which might go all the way up to 1, might come all the way down to minus 1, depends how big x is, right? Um, how much sine wave gets, gets um, Calculated as part of this integration for this for this just sine t. And I'm just pointing at this sine t and sine t. Okay. Um, the reason I'm making that distinction is because now we've got to think about um, the sign on the outside. Uh, and not uh, Ramanujan in chat says if it's tricky, draw a picky, uh, which is a phrase I learned from chat a while ago. I can't draw a horizontal line to save my life. There we go. That will do. Um, so what are we doing? We've got sine of stuff that's between uh, minus 1 and 1. Um, and if we're in radians, then 1 radian is not that big. It, it's not as big as pi of 2 radians. Um, crucial fact here, pi is bigger than 2. Okay, um, so that means that the sine that we're calculating here I can't get all the way up to one. Um, right, let me think. What am I? What am I doing? Um, so I think I'm plotting it against t. Um, what's going on here? Um, we've got the integral from naught up to x. Oh, I suppose we're going up to x is how far we're going to integrate it. So I kind of want to draw this all the way up to two pi, and then talk about how much of it we've got. Like, what's the upper limit? It, it's somewhere between naught and two pi. So I kind of want to draw this all the way up to 2 pi. Okay, let's go. Um, so when, when um, the variable t is between 0 and pi over 2, this thing inside will increase from 0 up to 1, and the thing outside then will increase from 0 up to 
sine of one. Whoop, like this. Sine of one. That's a bit of a weird number. Um, so it's going to go up like that. Um, I've drawn it flattening off uh, because I think after that it's going to come back down again. And it's going to come back down because the numbers that we're plugging into this sign are getting smaller again. Um, they're getting smaller because t t is getting larger. T has gone past pi over two towards pi, so now we're going from t from pi over two up to pi, and sine this inside sign is coming down again. On the way back down again, of course, the outside sign sees that decreasing function back down towards zero, and it says, oh, okay, I'll decrease as well then. So this shape I'm drawing is not quite your normal sine curve. Um, it's distorted a little bit by being uh, kind of a pass through another sine function. It does some distortion. A bit like how sine and t are the same shape, right? Like one of them's curvy and one of them's straight. Like, you know, adding, adding another sine makes things different. Um, what's it going to do after that? Uh, it's going to go negative, right? Yeah, it's going to go negative. And then it's going to go back again. It's going to get down to minus one, right? Oh, minus, uh, be careful, uh, sine of minus one, which is the same thing as minus sine of one, but be careful. It doesn't get down to minus one because the, it just sees this sine t coming as its input. Sine t is only going to get down as far as my, um, minus sine of one. Okay, so I've drawn something that looks pretty much like a sine wave, um, but I want to highlight that it's really, really not. Um, it's sine of sine. Uh, you can't do this in the test, of course, but let's have a quick look at sine of sine of x and talk about how weird it is. Not that weird. <laughs> not that weird at all. Um, homework, if I put the number 2 in here, it gets a little bit weirder. If I put 3 in here, it's weird. Uh, if I put 10 in here, it's really quite weird indeed. Um, what's going on? Why is... Why is it different in those different cases? Uh, but sine of sine of x is actually pretty much what I've drawn. Uh, expert over here. Um, okay, so if you want to get zero when you integrate from naught up to x, I just called myself an expert on a live stream. That's so weird. Do you ever wonder what you're doing? Um, we're integrating from naught up to x, and we're supposed to get exactly zero, um, which makes me feel a bit sort of suspicious again. Um, it's a bit weird to get zero as your result because look, I'm adding together all these little positive rectangles. I'm, I'm doing a positive area. I suppose now I'm doing a negative area under here, like positive area over here and a negative area. But I think this is only going to balance when it gets out to two pi. Uh, symmetry being symmetry, right? The up bit is probably the same as the down bit, but the other way up. So I think I think probably x has to be two pi. Seems likely anyway. Um, we have to get all the way out there. Uh, in Romania, you learn about radians pretty early. Um, if you do, I want to know about sine of sine of sine of sine of sine of sine of, of x, um, which I'm afraid is a bit of a disappointing function. Um, uh, that goes to zero for all eventually. Um, uh, we can check it with Desmos. So adding an extra sign in uh, makes the thing flatter uh, and closer to zero. Wait, hang on, this isn't getting closer to zero. Why is it not getting closer to zero? Oh, uh, is there a solution of sine x equals x in the region? Yes, it's getting closer and closer to 0 0.5. Oh, it's actually really good. Okay, we're gonna get very slightly sidetracked by this. Um, Desmos lets you declare a function. Um, so, just to answer a cool question, what happens if you apply sine lots of times? Um, the best way I know to do this is to define functions where you ask Desmos to apply the function lots and lots of times so that here it's applying f, oh, I think I've typed it five times, um, but each f is five signs. Um, so g here is 25 signs. Um, and it kind of flattens out, which is pretty cool. Um, if I make it do 125 signs by applying that function lots of times again, yeah, it's kind of doing this kind of on-off flat, um, in-out flattening thing. Oh, it is getting smaller on the values. Why is it getting smaller on the values? Okay, homework question. What's going on here? What's going on with these numbers? Good. Very good. Uh, seeing NCS, yeah, I'm coming to NCS uh, virtually. So I'm doing an NCS thing. Uh, that's going to be fun. See you tomorrow.
Uh, oh, I, I acted there like I was wrapping up, but I'm not wrapping up. I've got half an hour of maths to do. Um, I was going to check if I got H correct there. What do we think in chat? People don't seem that cross with me. I think I'm sort of getting away. Yeah, X has got to be 2 pi. So the, the structure of this question, before I move on, sorry. The structure of the question. Oh, yeah, listening to that would have been really good. Um, I've got audio. I kind of worked out how to do audio. No, you should not make it into audio. Anyway, um, structure of this question then is, here's a weird function. Um, we're not actually going to get you to integrate it. Like you, you really can't integrate this function nicely. Um, you can't write down an expression for what the you can't write down a nice expression for what the what the integral is. But we're sort of testing what you know about integration, representing the area, and we're testing can you sketch this weird function. So it's sort of a crossover question, which kind of two styles of questions um, that I've seen before. So sort of weird function, um, but in some sort of weird collaboration with integration uh, is area. Um, and I've seen questions based around this idea before, integration is area, here's a weird function, um, but kind of never quite like this. Uh, let's, do, let's do another integration question quickly, just because it's in the thumbnail. Oh yeah, so that's just one solution. X has to be 2 pi. Which is just one solution, so I pick B. Ah, sine X is gray and small, so the sine thing happens. Mm. Sort of believe you. I no longer think there's any solution to sine X equals X. I'm getting distracted, which is not good, but you know. Yeah, what did I plot? I plot it like this. Oh, it was just showing me zero. It was just showing me zero, so it does go to zero. Right, can I do an impressive one instead? Yeah, that's the answer. That's the question. Okay, so proper homework question. Sorry. Um, in chat we've been talking about applying sine lots of times. I've decided that was a bit disappointing. It just goes to zero. Um, the new question that I'd actually like to ask you is what's happening for cos. Um, because cos is doing something interesting. There we go. There's the pretty picture that I wanted. Four, three causes, four causes. Maybe you can see that there's something going on in these pictures. Red, green, purple, black. Um, what's going on there? Ooh, they all go through that point. And these ones all go through this point. That's kind of nice. There's like three, three for the price of one inside there. Um, hmm. uh, you might have opinions about what's going on inside, inside those regions with more and more cosine. That's what I wanted to show you, cosine. Good old Desmos. Oh, I forgot to show you the sound of the graph. Um, F is the thumbnail. Um, we're asked about whether this integral is positive or negative. So sorry for the clickbait. Uh, the thumbnail makes it look like you're going to have to do the integral, but in fact, we're just going to talk about whether this is positive or not. Um, so in particular, we're going to say things like cosine of 3x is a positive number for x between 0 and pi over 8. Um, so this integral is adding together positive things, so this bracket is positive. Um, we're going to look at sine x, which is, of course, a negative function in this range. Um, so this term here is going to be negative because it's the integral of some, something that's below the x-axis. Um, I'm going to look at cosine, which in that range I believe is positive, um, the cos x between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. So this is some sort of positive bit over here. So I believe this thing works out as being negative overall because it's some positive number times negative number times a positive number. I think it works out to be a negative thing. Um, don't love the fact that this is uh, an option because I don't think you know very many facts about when whether integrals are defined or not. So I don't think you'd know. How would you know whether this is okay? I mean, I'm, I'm telling you it's okay. Oh, three solutions of which are equal zero. Oh no, sorry, okay, sorry, the, the value of this function, the value of sine of sine of t equals zero three times. Uh, I agree. Um, the integral of sine of sine of t is something quite kind of different, right? Um, this integral equals zero just once. Um, because the integral adds up all of the area from zero up to x. Uh, where well, x might be somewhere over here, in which case it'll give me a positive answer. It might be over here, in which case it'll give me the nicely, it'll give me the area of everything um, on that left bit. It might be over here, in which case there's some positive contribution, there's some negative contribution that do not cancel out. 
I have to put x all the way over here in order to get the positive contribution to the integral to cancel out with the negative contribution to the integral. Um, I'm going to move that before it looks like I've labelled the axis and I get confused. Good. Um, so I kind of agreed three times for the value of the function, but I want the integral. Uh, back up in the question, there is all this integration to deal with. Um, cool. Uh, ah, yeah, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, so in general, you should be a little bit skeptical about integrals with um, functions in the denominator, uh, things where you might be dividing by zero, um, but in fact, we're not dividing by zero, so this is all fine. Um, so this is kind of like, are we divided by zero? Uh, uh, it's almost, but not quite that. Um, yeah. Oh, does tan, 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 tan get a bit weird? There you go. I'm sure it does, because tan, uh, uh, I, maybe you know that tan x is greater than x uh, for not x less than pi over 2. And then when you do tan again, oh, I don't know, maybe it's, oh no, because then it could be a really large number that's in some different range of, now I want to try that. Okay, uh, your content is making it onto the live stream. Everyone say thank you, Herb. We're doing tan of x. Tan of tan of x? Oh, that is already great. Oh, this is fantastic content. This is what people say. Oh, yeah, this is what people want on a live stream. Increasingly horrible tan combinations. I'm going to go to four. Oh, no. That was an error. Let's quickly look at the structure of the purple one. Oh, it's giving me... um. Oh, it's giving me fractal vibes. It's giving me Cantor set. It's giving me... Uh, self-similarity. Oh, it's excellent. Oh, that's very nice. I like that a lot. Uh, they're not quite... Um, I suppose maybe I should be clear. Are these vertical lines or not? Like this bit clearly you can see is not a vertical line. Um, it's going between minus infinity and infinity quite frequently and quite quickly. And then sometimes it isn't. <laughs> sometimes it's quite slow. Yeah, that's horrible, isn't it? Sorry, everyone, for making you look at some sort of really fractal barcode. They're not quite vertical. Didn't make it sound, and I didn't read your chat comment in time. I wonder how they make barcodes, right? Um, does sine of sine of x have two solutions? Zero and five. Oh! Yeah. Yeah. Good point, Andrew. They banned zero, so it should just be... When I was talking about those three things, I should have banned zero. Just talk about. Yeah, cool. Just twice. They banned zero. Um, you said not and pi, but I think you mean two pi and pi. Yep, good stuff. Right, we're kind of doing multiple questions at the same time now, so that's fun. Uh, isn't integrating sine minus cos? Ah. Oh. Ah. Nick, I wish it works like that. I wish it works like that. Um, function of a function is really horrible. Um, you don't learn a rule for it at A level because there isn't a nice rule for integrating function of a function. You learn lots of nice rules, but I guess part of the transition to university is discovering that discovering that you've been told the answers in certain nice cases and that there are also not nice cases in which you have not been told an answer because there isn't a nice answer. Um, integrating f of g of x is one of them. Uh, which is just like, I've no idea how to do that in general. Sorry. It's not some like clever combination of the derivatives of f and g or the integrals of f and g separately. It's just, it's just a mess. I mean, it defines function, but it's not obvious to me what you're going to get. Uh, cool. Um, is there a good way of plotting the derivatives of functions in Desmos? Uh, yeah, you can just type a prime, I think. Uh, if you declare your function, so if you tell it that f of x is this uh, cubic that I like, um, then you can just tell it to plot like f prime of x, and it just does it. So I've typed the apostrophe key on my keyboard, and it's just plotted the derivative for me. It can do automatic differentiation. It can do differentiation of pretty complicated stuff. Can it do like it be x? I think it can do like derivatives of stuff that maybe maybe you can't, which would be fun. Uh, fun way of getting Desmos to do some work for us. Oh yeah, cool. It can do two to the x. You can do the derivative to the x. Okay, cool, good. Homework, what's going on there? Integration is harder than differentiation, except then you learn. <laughs> then you learn that differentiation is actually quite hard too. Um, and 
Uh, there came a, came a point where my friends doing more pure maths than me told me quite somberly that they'd realised that once again, integration was easy and differentiation was hard. <laughs> Which is probably the wrong way around. But whatever. Okay. I think people are ready for turn three. We haven't done a long question for a while. I've got about 20 minutes uh, on the stream, um, which is kind of not really enough time to do uh, a long question. So we're going to do elements of a long question. Um, this is actually good news for you if you haven't done the questions before, um, because I'm not going to spoil all of the answers. If you want the answers, you can get them uh, off the MATLAB website or indeed on the MAT website, links in the description. Uh, alpha says the indefinite integral of Sorry, so it's not classically, yeah, classically exist means that somebody gave a name to it, which you should pay some attention to, I guess. It's like kilometers and miles, right? Um, if somebody gave it a name. Like, there are particular functions that have names for their integrals. When is differentiation harder than integration? Uh, integration is a smoothing operation. Sometimes quite nasty functions, you can integrate them. But differentiation, oh, it's just surprisingly difficult. Uh, your function could be, look quite nice, but not have a... Nice derivative. Uh, good. Okay, let's briefly talk about elements of two. So this is about combinations of functions, uh, combining them lots and lots of times. Uh, so I see your question about other similar questions, but I've just started. Um, so f to the power of i, or we're using this. It's not really a power. We're using this notation to mean applying it i times. So add one i times. Okay, I agree. That means add the same thing as adding i, because it's f of, sorry, because it's x plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus dot 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 plus 1, with like i times of these, which is the line I haven't written because it looks silly. Um, right, okay, uh, advice for showing something like this, which looks ugly, uh, f squared on the left, g, g, f. Um, showing something like this, I would do it directly. So I would work out what this what this means, um, and this means something like uh, do f squared. Sorry, it means oh, what order are we doing these in? Oh my goodness, look at this. And this is kind of sensible because of how brackets work and how function notation is a bit weird anyway. Um, but we write f g to mean g then f. That's weird, really, isn't it? And um, so on the right here, this means apply f and then apply g. I say that's the function two x plus two. Uh, uh, what else have we got? We've got f squared g, um, which is the same thing as doing, well, we know that f squared means add 2, but we're doing that after we've done g of x. So g of x means do 2x, and then f squared means add 2 to it. So both sides are 2x plus 2, which is the same function. So that's pretty good. Um, these things are genuinely equal. I would not lay it out like this when I'm writing out my solution for a map question. I would write some words and some of the stuff I'm saying out loud, I write on a bit of paper. Um, okay, um, part two, uh, combinations of f and g that result in this function. Um, something that I'm always trying to encourage people to do is to consider reusing the previous parts of the questions. And I'm saying that now because I can see that there's an f squared g, and that, that's the same thing we had in the previous part. Um, it's something I've only really got good at recently i suppose I, I i wanted to do it more um because when i was getting ready for university a lot of university admissions tests are good at doing this sort of thing where you reuse the previous part of the question but i was really pretty bad at spotting it um it's very satisfying when you spot it that hang on a minute this thing is the same as in here so an additional g means multiply by two and okay i agree with the statement in the question an additional g means multiply this thing we were just talking about by two uh, and then I'll get 4x plus 4. Cool, good, okay. Um, but of course, using the previous fact means that we just showed that that was equal to gf. Um, so I know that this thing is equal to g, gf, um, because I know that f squared g inside is the same thing as gf. So I've already got a way to write down another way that works. Um, that's a little bit weird. Um, I'm kind of using the previous part. I don't have to evaluate this. I mean, I'm probably going to, to check my answer. Um, but uh, I can use the previous part of the question. Right to left, like matrices and some other stuff. Uh, people know what right-hand side and left-hand side means? Uh, you're going to be fine. Um, 
in general, if somebody's marking something and you use an acronym that they don't know or some notation that they don't understand, um, the markers talk to each other. And if they don't understand, they talk to me. Um, and between us, we've seen a lot of different sorts of maths. Uh, okay, um, I can see another thing we can do. Um, I've got a GF over here. I saw the F squared G first, but there's a GF hiding in here, isn't there? This is the same thing as GFFG, if you're doing the F twice. Um, so this GF, I can replace that with an F squared G, which gives me the kind of mad expression that I wouldn't have guessed. Um, F squared G, F G. And I can replace this GF over here with um, F squared G. I wouldn't have guessed this at all. Okay. Oh, and then on this one, I've spotted there's another GF, so I could do it again. Um, so put new expression. So I've found several expressions already that, um, found several expressions that, Give me 4x plus 4. In fact, I found all of them. Yeah, exactly. So anonymous person in chat. I do it without i, but that's easier. It is possible to do this without using part i at all. And that's fine. And perfectly valid. Um, the way you would do this without part i, which I think I, I kind of want to do anyway, um, in order to find all of the ways. And who knows? Maybe there are other ways that I can find with um, some other ways that, that exist um, that don't use part i. Um, Find all of the ways, I probably want to think about um, how many F's and G's I want in total. Um, I thought earlier there was a notation about how many U's and R's we want. I think a little bit about how many F's and G's I want. Definitely not too many F's, right? Because if I have too many F's, then the constant on this polynomial will be really large. Um, and probably not too many G's, otherwise the coefficient of X will get really large. In fact, I think I want exactly two Gs um, and at most four Fs. Quick check, that describes everything I've got so far. Sanity check, good. Um, so I want exactly two Gs and at most four Fs to get the coefficients sensible. Uh, and it's some combinations of those. That's not too many things to check. I could maybe check cases about what happens if I've got two or three or four Fs. If I have no Fs, it's rubbish because I'm just going just to get four X. And I know these are all the possibilities that I don't. I've got to argue about it now. I've got to think about what else might be out there. Um, is there something with exactly three Fs? Um, I think probably not, but it's not obvious, right? Um, so I think I would look at, in general, oh gosh, it's something like this. <laughs> I would write down maybe something like this. So reading ahead is sometimes helpful as well. Um, this involves applying f's and then doing a g and then applying f's to another g. That's nice because the coefficient of x will now be 4. There'll be a 4x at the front and then add on some more at the end. Um, let's work this out. So I, I like to jump around the question as well. Um, maybe that's not good. Maybe it's a bit sort of hyper. But if, if I'm evaluating this, I add, the k, add k first, then multiply by 2, then add j, then multiply by 2, then add i. Where I'm doing that really fast, I'm I'm really comfortable using previous parts of the question. Where I suppose proof parts of the question, we've now got used to this idea that f applied i times just means add i. So I'm just doing. I'm reading it right to left because they say perform that one first, and I'm just doing one step at a time. And I'm really happy that's going to be four x plus. Aha! Here, this looks nice. I'm four k plus two j plus i. That is good. Oh, I like that a lot. It's got four two one. So then the previous way was, how do you make four? And you can make four in several different ways. Because you could say k is one, nothing else is there. Or you could say k is zero, and then think about chase nice. Oh, this is systematic, I like it. Yeah, and this, in fact, this is part four of the question. So part four extends the result. Previously, we talked about all of the ways of making uh, this with m equals one. I think we found all of them. We found some strategy for checking lots of cases to get there. Um, but what I want now, I suppose, is that uh, 4k plus 2j plus i is equal to 4m. That is pretty nice. I like that a lot. Um, so there are separate cases in here, and I think it's going to work out to be a kind of triangle number situation, but I think I want to let you explore that one as well. Uh, question reminds you of writing things in base 2. Um, there's some base 2 stuff going on because of doubling, um, but importantly, i and j and k are now allowed to be any numbers, so it's not quite binary. Um, uh, what is part 2 when it says determine? 
Oh, yeah, so determine here means, um, I suppose, kind of the same thing as, as simplify. Um, or, you know, this is kind of a disguise for this nice simple function. Um, so I suppose you could read that as simplify. Um, or, uh, you know, if, if it was, um, uh, I can imagine a phrasing that was like, separate question. Um, x is 17, y is 9, uh, determine the value of x squared plus y squared. It kind of find, right? Find is the way of reading this. What is? Uh, cool. Uh, I read your 3 is 2. It's a downside of Roman numerals, isn't it? How many marks would you get if you didn't argue to have all the possibilities? Good question. Let's have a look. Where are we? Probably a couple. I'd give you a couple. If I was in charge of marking this question. This is part of my PR plan to make myself seem like a reasonable person. Uh, should be in charge of marking. What are we doing? We're doing question two. And I am in charge of marking. Yeah, it's a triangle number sort of thing. You gotta parameterize it. It's nice. Uh, ooh, so that was worth three marks. And the mark scheme that I'm looking at, or the, the sample answer from the website, which is the only record that we've got to download from the website, uh, doesn't go to any effort to say that those are the only sequences that work. So I think, think that answers your question pretty comprehensively as, yes, you can have all the marks if you didn't bother to explain why that was all of them. Uh, older web solutions, a little bit. A little bit less um, comprehensive than some of the some of the other ones. Good. Okay. Uh, can't figure out if you found all the possible computations. Apparently, I've just moved on. Um, you might like to you might like to describe a system. I've seen people do this before, where they sort of describe a system of how they would systematically do the search. Because then I can maybe give you a method mark for having a having a method, right? Of having a kind of system of how you would do the search. I don't know. Uh, so sort of work systematically through uh, f up to the value of four for how many f's there are. Work up to g, check all permutations or something. But then don't actually do it. And then maybe you can have a method mark. We'll see. Of course, key thing. Yeah, could you use part four? No, I do find this quite cheeky when people try and use them later parts of the question but actually four doesn't tell you the answer so if you've done four then if you've done part four you're probably going to get you're probably going to do you're probably going to do all the parts of this question and it's not a discussion and you're going to get lots of marks we'll see well, this is not really a marking live stream in general your aim should be to solve the question have an idea tell me about it or tell the markers about it it's probably not healthy to imagine that you're telling me about it. You can do that if you like. Um, tell me about it. Um, that's your plan. Marking happens afterwards. And, and should be nice to you if you did have the idea and do the maths and get the answer. Um, okay, let's take elements from three for just a few minutes here um, before wrapping up on the seven. That's been quite a fast two hours, hasn't it? Um, I'm not really sure if we've done more or less than we usually do. Uh, writing a personal statement. You're planning to apply to Oxbridge. God, it's close to your chest there. It could be Oxford, it could be Cambridge. It's the mysterious Oxbridge. Uh, I've heard about this. Uh, is there any advice you gave now someone like me from your experience? Uh, get stuck on some maths problems. Doesn't matter what they are, where you found them. Oh, yes. What would a missions officer be most impressed by on a personal statement? Uh, you don't have to impress me. I think that's like life advice as well. Um, are you, there are other people in your life that you might need to impress, but you don't need to impress me. Um, I'm looking to see if you'd be um, prepared to do an intensive maths course with us. Um, so I'm looking at your preparation. And I'm looking at what I suppose you're interested in to see if you're going to stick with this kind of maths course, please. Um, but you don't need to impress me at this point. You're going to impress me later on when you do uh, the course. That's going to be impressive. Cool, right, good. I suppose maybe I am impressed by maths. So if you if you're interested in maths and you want to tell me about some maths, then I guess that's impressive. But I, I I don't think it's healthy for you to think of it as 
like a performance that you're doing um, for my benefit or something. Like it's information. You're giving me information um, about what you're doing. Uh, if you want to think about it in that kind of cold clinical terms, like oh, here's some information. You're going to read the information and then you're going to give me a place at university. Sounds like some sort of logical interaction, right? Cool. I realize I'm staring at the camera very intensely and doing life advice, which is not a good combination. It's not really that sort of live stream. So I'm going to go back to doing this question now. Cool. Uh, here's a cubic. Uh, the cubic's got two distinct turning points. They're lab labeled A and B. Uh, the axes have been omitted, which means I can imagine that this cubic is drawn to the scale of Jamesometers again. Brilliant. Uh, so the A and B are like several Jamesometers apart, I think. Uh, find a conditional conversion of A, B, and C. Ah, I see. Okay. Um, so it's kept as two distinct turning points. Oh, lovely. If and only if this condition is satisfied. I've used a version of this as an interview question before, which then went to different places. But, you know, nice to see some of the uh, same thing. So the derivative is a quadratic. Two turning points. That means two uh, solutions to um, f prime x equals zero. Two distinct solutions, I suppose, is the missing word over here. Um, two distinct solutions to f prime x equals zero. Um, that's quadratic, you know loads about solving quadratics. Um, we can now assume that it's satisfied. Hint, the rest of the question seems to be involving these like square roots of some object. Gosh, it would be bad if that thing inside was negative, right? Ooh, someone should check that that thing inside the square root is positive. Whew. Good. Um, uh, good. Uh, show that. Uh, these coordinates so then actually going to like solve the quadratic i guess and so like write down solutions to the quadratic which sounds a bit like you know solving the thing oh i suppose then you'll take the difference between them you, at this point you have a quadratic that you can go and solve right let's try and solve it uh minus oh, it's a bit hard because a and b are not in the usual places for a quadratic so you have to be a little bit careful here right four a squared minus four uh first term, last term, divided by two times the first thing. Oh my goodness, that was actually painful. Uh, I see, okay. And then there's a difference in here. There's a factor of two from bringing out the fours. There's an a squared minus three B. There's an extra factor of two because there's plus minus, and I'm going to take the difference. And this bit will cancel out between the difference. Okay, good. Uh, but those are the solutions. And look, I need the square root. Uh, there's the discriminant right there. Good. Um, explicitly show it isn't, if and only with words and going both ways. What? Oh, yeah, that's not, uh, going both ways is the important element. Words is always yeah, fine. Um, uh, interviews, interviewers and admissions officers can see your actual paper. Uh, Oxford, we are going to get scans of everything and attach them to our database. Um, uh, that's one of the reasons that we ask you to put working out for the multiple choice questions um, in case we want to have a look at it. And it's not ridiculous for a tutor to look at someone's work and say, oh, this candidate's got by a borderline, kind of, oh, I'm not sure, are we going to take them or not? Um, let's look at that match script. Oh, they, they're close to getting some marks on this multiple choice question, which would have been four more marks. And I think we can all agree. If, 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 if a tutor's arguing to shortlist you, I think they might say something like that. I think, yeah. If they'd just made a slightly different mistake here, then they would have got the correct answer and been given four marks. And that, then we wouldn't be having this discussion. We'd have shortlisted them already. That's the kind of simulation of the discussion. It is now 7 p.m. and I'm going to stop talking about this at some point. Um, uh, we're going to translate it so that it goes through the origin. That's why it's got the value zero. Um, it's the turning point, which is why it's got zero derivative. I've seen this question sort of thing before where um, uh, zero derivative uh, repeated root because it's got uh, repeated root means that it's got this factor of x squared in it. Uh, and that is an expression, I think, to tell me where to look for the other root. Not totally sure that I can see why that's like two thirds or something, but hey. Um, good, there's an integral to do, but at this stage, I think we know just about everything. We now know the whole function. Um, there's a kind of weird tagline at the bottom about rational numbers, but this is not very, uh, there's just some expression, right? That relates together A and B and R. And once you've got an expression, it's not that hard to argue about um, rational numbers and things. Good, okay. Uh, can we use, Minus B. Oh, yeah. Um, I considered doing it up here. Um, you, you're allowed to use cool quadratic formula, which is this one. Um, uh, be a little bit careful. Um, if this causes you to just write down the right answer with no other explanation, then you might like to add by quadratic formula. 
or quadratic formula, um, which again is that thing about you know that you had a method in mind. Um, uh, and this question actually <laughs> doesn't quite have that particular result. Um, please don't leave it so that if you just write down the answer in a flash of genius, but the question was like, show that. So if your show that is, aha, I've had an idea. I've had an idea. I shall not tell you g of x equals x squared x minus root a squared minus 3b. Do you see how that's not that's quite hard to mark? It's quite hard to give you the marks um, because it looks like you're bluffing. Um, and if you don't write, aha, I've had an idea, then it looks even more like you're bluffing, even though well, maybe actually looks less suspicious. Um, but if you don't, if you don't write any words, um, then sometimes for a show that question, it's really hard for us to give you the marks. Um, yeah, I thought about not approving that chat message, but I thought it'd be funnier to approve the chat message. Um, good. Uh, short answer, uh, yeah, sure. Go for it. Right, good. We've hit seven o'clock, uh, which means I need to wrap up. Um, we did not get time to talk about... Oh, no, we did several of these on the live stream before, and I've done the one in the thumbnail, so it's not a clickbait that doesn't lead to any video in particular. If you want to see some more solutions, um, there are uh, PDFs on the uh, Matt website link over there. If I get time, I'm planning to make uh, longer videos going through these, if I get time. Uh, maybe not in time for them to be super helpful for you because we've now done these past papers. Um, in a few weeks time, we'll catch up with ones where I have made videos. What I want to tell you here is, oh, and if you want to see me talk about all the other questions that we didn't talk about on the live stream, here's a two hour video. Um, making those two hour videos takes a really long time. Um, and I haven't done all of the past papers. Uh, but so, okay. But now I've said it out loud, so I'm trying to help you out. So for three, we just say repeated roots. Yeah, I think so, something like that. You're going to talk about derivatives, right? Oh, that's something fake. There's a flashcard about this, about repeated roots. Uh, yeah, there's a PQ formula. There's other stuff as well. Right, good. Okay. People, quad quadratic science is like this whole thing that I have a lot of time for, but not time right now. Bye. See you in 166 hours for another episode of the Oxford Matt live stream. Take care, everyone. Have a good weekend. Bye. And Friday. Bye. <laughs>